Section 14 of Report to the President by the Presidential Commission on the Space Shuttle Challenger Accident. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marwak. Report to the President by the Presidential Commission on the Space Shuttle Challenger Accident. Chapter 6. An Accident Rooted in History. Part 3. Leak Check and Putty In addition to the action item from NASA headquarters, another result of the 41-B erosion was a warning written by John Q. Miller, Marshal Chief of the Solid Motor Branch, to George Hardy, through Keith Coates. Miller was worried about the two charred rings on 41-B and the missing putty found when the solid rocket boosters were recovered and disassembled. He specifically identified the putty's sensitivity to humidity and temperature as potential sources of problems. The thermal design of the solid rocket motor joints depends on thermal protection of the O-ring by the putty, Miller said. Failure of the putty to provide a thermal barrier can lead to burning both O-rings and subsequent catastrophic failure. The memorandum also said that the O-ring leak check procedure and its potential effect on the putty installation and possible displacement is also an urgent concern which requires expedition of previously identified full-scale tests. From the beginning, Thiokol had suspected the putty was a contributing factor in O-ring erosion, even after STS-2. In April 1983, Thiokol reported on tests conducted to study the behavior of the joint putty. One conclusion of the report was that the STS-2 erosion was probably caused by blowholes in the putty, which allowed a jet of hot gas to focus on a point on the primary O-ring. Thiokol discovered the focused jet ate away or impinged on portions of the O-ring. Thiokol calculated that the maximum possible impingement erosion was 0 .090 inch, and that lab tests proved that an O-ring would seal at 3,000 psi when erosion of 0 .095 inches was simulated. This safety margin was the basis for approving shuttle flights while accepting the possibility of O-ring erosion. Shortly after Miller's routing slip to Hardy about the urgent concern of the missing putty on 41-B at Thiokol, Brian Russell authored a letter to Robert Ebeling, which analyzed the erosion history and the test data. Russell's April 19, 1984 conclusion was that the putty itself and its layup were not at fault, but that the higher stabilization pressure adopted in leak chuck procedures, first implemented in one field joint on STS-9, may increase the chances of O-ring erosion. The conclusion by Miller and Russell was that the air pressure forced through the joint during the O-ring leak check was creating more putty blowholes, allowing more focused jets on the primary O-ring, thereby increasing the frequency of erosion. This hypothesis that O-ring erosion is related to putty blowholes is substantiated by the leak check history. Prior to January 1984 and STS-41-B, when the leak check pressure was 50 or 100 psi, only one field joint O-ring anomaly had been found during the first nine flights. However, when the leak check stabilization pressure was officially boosted to 200 psi for STS-41-B, over half the shuttle missions experienced field joint O-ring blow-by or erosion of some kind. Moreover, the nozzle O-ring history of problems is similar. The nozzle joint leak check was changed from 50 psi to 100 psi before STS-9 launched in November 1983. After this change, the incidence of O-ring anomalies in the nozzle joint increased from 12% to 56% for all shuttle flights. The nozzle pressure was increased to 200 psi for mission 51-D in April 1985 and 51-G in June 1985, and all subsequent missions. Following the implementation of the 200 PSI check on the nozzle, 88% of all flights experienced erosion or blow-by. Other Thiokol and NASA witnesses agreed that they were aware that the increase in blowholes in the putty could contribute to O-ring erosion. 
The commission testimony of May 2, 1986 reads, Dr. Walker, the analysis that some of our staff has done suggests that after you increase the test pressure to 200 pounds, the incidence of blow-by and erosion actually increased. Mr. Russell, we realized that. Lawrence Malloy was also questioned about the blowholes in the putty. Dr. Walker, do you agree that the primary cause of the erosion is the blowholes in the putty? Mr. Malloy, I believe it is, yes. Dr. Walker, and so your leak check procedure created blowholes in the putty? Mr. Malloy, that is one cause of blowholes in the putty. Dr. Walker, but in other words, your leak check procedure could indeed cause what was your primary problem. Didn't that concern you? Mr. Malloy, yes, sir. Notwithstanding the knowledge that putty blowholes caused erosion and that higher pressure in the leak check caused more blowholes, Thiokol recommended and NASA accepted the increased pressure to ensure that the joint actually passed the integrity tests. The documentary evidence produced by NASA and Thiokol demonstrates that Marshall was very concerned about the putty erosion blowhole problem after STS-41-B. In addition to John Miller's routing slip about putty on STS-41-B discussed above, there is a report of a June 7, 1984 telephone conference between Messrs. Thompson, Coates, and Ray, Marshall, and Messrs. Sayer, Boisjoly, Russell, and Parker, Thiokol, among others. Marshall told Thiokol that NASA was very concerned about the O-ring erosion problem and that design changes were necessary, including possible putty changes. The Thiokol engineers discussed Marshall's suggestions after the telephone conference, but decided they could not agree a change was mandatory. A follow-up telephone conference was held between Ben Powers of Marshall and Lawrence Sayer of Thiokol on July 2. Powers told Sayer that NASA would not accept the removal of the putty from the joint and that everyone expected the test to show that gas jets would damage an O-ring. However, Powers expressly stated that Marshall would not accept Thiokol's opinion that no further tests were necessary. In mid-1984, the early tests after NASA's action item for 41-C led Thiokol to the conclusion that O-ring erosion was a function of the putty blowhole size and the amount of free volume between the putty orifice and the O-ring. The damage to the O-ring was judged to be worse when the blowhole was smaller and the free volume was larger. While Thiokol did establish plans for putty tests to determine how it was affected by the leak check in response to the 41-C action item, their progress in completing the test was slow. The action item was supposed to be completed by May 30, 1984, but as late as March 6, 1985, there are Marshall internal memos that complain that Thiokol had not taken any action on Marshall's December 1983 directive to provide data on putty behavior as affected by the joint leak check stabilization pressure. Figure 4. A table showing NASA official, position, and description of awareness of O-ring problems. John Young, Chief Astronaut Office. The secret seal, which no one that we know knew about. Milton Silvera, Chief Engineer. If I had known, I'm sure in the 82 time period, when we first came to that conclusion, that the seal was not redundant. I would have insisted that we get busy right now on a design change and also look for any temporary fix we could do to improve the operation of the seal. James Beggs, former NASA Administrator. I had no specific concerns with the joint, the O-rings, or the putty. Arnold Aldrich, Manager, National Space Transportation System. Jesse Moore, former Associate Administrator for Spaceflight. Richard Smith, Director, Kennedy Space Center, and James A. Thomas, Deputy Director, Kennedy Launch and Landing Operations. None were aware of Thiokol's concern about negative effect of cold temperature on O-ring performance, nor were they informed of the same concern raised after STS-51-C. End Figure 4 STS-51-C and Cold Temperature on January 24, 1985, STS-51-C was launched. The temperature of the O-rings at launch was 53 degrees, the coldest to that date. O-ring erosion occurred in both solid boosters. 
the right and left nozzle joint showed evidence of blow-by between the primary and secondary O-rings. The primary O-ring in the left booster's forward field joint was eroded and had blow-by, or soot, behind the ring. The right booster's damage was in the center field joint, the first time that field joint seal was damaged. Both its primary and secondary O-rings were affected by heat, and the primary ring also had evidence of blow-by of soot behind it. This was also the first flight where a secondary O-ring showed the effect of heat. STS-51-C was the second example of O-ring damage in flight, where there was evidence of blow-by erosion as well as impingement erosion. As noted previously, Impingement erosion occurs where the O-ring has already sealed and a focused jet of hot gas strikes the surface of the ring and removes a portion of it. Blow-by erosion happens when the O-ring has not yet sealed the joint gap and the edge of the ring erodes as the hot gas flows around it. Roger Beaujolais described the blow-by erosion seen in 51-C. SRM-15, STS-51-C actually increased our concern because that was the first time we had actually penetrated a primary O-ring on a field joint with hot gas, and we had a witness of that event because the grease between the O-rings was blackened just like coal, and that was so much more significant than had ever been seen before on any blow-by on any joint. The fact was that now you introduced another phenomenon. You have impingement erosion and bypass erosion and the O-ring material gets removed from the cross-section of the O-ring much, much faster when you have bypass erosion or blow-by. Beaujolais also said blow-by erosion was where the primary O-ring at the beginning of the transient cycle is still being attacked by hot gas, and it is eroding at the same time it is trying to seal, and it is a race between will it erode more than the time allowed to have it seal. He described the blow-by on 51-C as over 100 degrees of arc, and the blow-by was absolutely jet black. It was totally intermixed in a homogeneous mixture in the grease. When the blow-by material was chemically analyzed, Beaujolais said, we found the products of putty in it. We found the products of O-ring in it. On the Marshall Problem Assessment Report that was started to track field joint erosion after STS-41-B, the STS-51-C O-ring anomaly was described as O-ring burns were as bad or worse than previously experienced. Design changes are pending test results. The changes being considered included modifying the O-rings and adding grease around the O-rings to fill the void left by putty blowholes. On January 31, 1985, Marshall Solid Rocket Booster Project Manager Malloy sent an urgent message to Lawrence Ware with a stated subject, 51-C O-ring erosion, RE 51-E FRR. The message ordered that the flight readiness review for the upcoming flight should recap all incidents of O-ring erosion, whether nozzle or case joint, and all incidents where there is evidence of flow past the primary O-ring. Also, the rationale used for accepting the condition on the nozzle O-ring. Also, the most probable scenario and limiting mechanism for flow past the primary on the 51-C case joints. If Thiokol does not have all of this for today, I would like to see the logic on a chart with blanks to be filled in. On February 8, 1985, Thiokol presented its most detailed analysis to date of the erosion problems to the Solid Rocket Motor Project Office at Marshall for what was then called Shuttle Mission 51-E, but later changed to 51-D. Thiokol included a report on damage incurred by the O-rings during Flight 51-C at the left forward and right center field joints. The right center joint had hot gas past the primary O-ring. Thiokol said that caused a concern that the gas seal could be lost, but its resolution was accept risk. Thiokol presented test results showing maximum expected erosion and maximum erosion experienced for both primary and secondary O-rings for the field and nozzle joints. Accepting damage to the primary O-ring was being justified in part based on an assumption of the secondary O-ring working even with erosion. 
However, the criticality classification indicated the primary seal was a single point of failure. During this flight readiness assessment at Marshall, for the first time, Thiokol mentioned temperature as a factor in O-ring erosion and blow-by. Thiokol said in its conclusions that low temperature enhanced probability of blow-by. Flight 51-C experienced worst-case temperature change in Florida history. Thiokol concluded that while the next shuttle flight could exhibit the same behavior, nonetheless the condition is not desirable but is acceptable. At the Level 1 Flight Readiness Review conducted on February 21, there was no detailed analysis of O-ring problems presented or any reference made to low temperature effects. Instead, a single reference indicated the O-ring erosion and blow-by experienced was acceptable because of limited exposure time and redundancy. STS-51-B and the Launch Constraint Joint seal problems occurred in each of the next four shuttle flights. Flight 51-D, launched April 12, 1985, had nozzle O-ring erosion and blow-by on an igniter joint. STS-51-B, launched 17 days later, experienced both nozzle O-ring erosion and blow-by, as did 51-G, which flew on the following June 17. STS-51-F, launched July 29, 1985, had nozzle O-ring blow-by. In response to the apparent negative effect of cold leading to the extensive O-ring problems on Flight 51-C in January, Thiokol conducted some O-ring resiliency tests in early 1985. The tests were conducted to quantify the seal timing function of the secondary O-ring and the effect of joint rotation on its ability to back up the primary ring. The key variable was temperature. The June 3 test report, which was described in an August 9, 1985 letter from Brian Russell at Thiokol to Jim Thomas at Marshall, showed, Bench test data indicate that the O-ring resiliency, its capability to follow the metal, is a function of temperature and rate of case expansion. Thiokol measured the force of the O-ring against instron platens, which simulated the normal squeeze on the O-ring and approximated the case expansion distance and rate. At 100 degrees Fahrenheit, the O-ring maintained contact. At 75 degrees, the O-ring lost contact for 2.4 seconds. At 50 degrees, the O-ring did not re-establish contact in 10 minutes, at which time the test was terminated. On June 25, 1985, the left nozzle joint of STS-51-B, launched April 29, was disassembled and inspected after it had been shipped back to Thiokol. What Thiokol found was alarming. The primary O-ring seal had been compromised because it eroded 0.171 inches and it did not seal. The secondary O-ring did seal, but it had eroded 0.032 inches. Lawrence Malloy described the 51-B problem as follows. The erosion of a secondary O-ring was a new and significant event that we certainly did not understand. Everything up to that point had been the primary O-ring. Even though it had experienced some erosion, does seal. What we had evidence of was that here was a case where the primary O-ring was violated and the secondary O-ring was eroded, and that was considered to be a more serious observation than previously observed. What we saw in 51-B it was evident that the primary ring never sealed at all, and we saw erosion all the way around that O-ring, and that is where the point .171 came from, and that was not in the model that predicted a maximum of .090. The maximum of .090 is the maximum erosion that can occur if the primary O-ring seals. But in this case, the primary O-ring did not seal. Therefore, you had another volume to fill, and the flow was longer, and it was blow-by, and you got more erosion. Upon receiving the report of the 51-B primary ring failure, Solid Rocket Booster Project Manager Malloy and the Marshall Problem Assessment Committee placed a launch constraint on the shuttle system. A 1980 Marshall letter which references assigning launch constraints on open problems submitted to MSFC PAS defines launch constraints as 
All open problems coded criticality 1, 1R, 2, or 2R will be considered launch constraints until resolved, recurrence control established, and its implementation effectively determined, or sufficient rationale, i.e., different configuration, etc., exists to conclude that this problem will not occur on the flight vehicle during pre-launch, launch, or flight. Lawrence Malloy told the Commission that the launch constraint was put on after we saw the secondary O-ring erosion on the 51-B nozzle. Based on the amount of charring, the problem report listing the constraint said, the erosion paths on the primary O-ring, and what is understood about the erosion phenomenon, it is believed that the primary O-ring of the joint never sealed. The constraint applied to STS-51-F and all flights subsequent, including STS-51-L. Although one Marshall document says that the constraint applied to all O-ring anomalies, no similar launch constraint was noted on the Marshall Problem Assessment Report that started tracking the field joint erosion after STS-41-B. Viacall officials who testified before the Commission all claimed they were not aware of the July 1985 launch constraint. However, Thiokol letters referenced Marshall Record Number A09288, the report that expressly identified the constraint. After the launch constraint was imposed, Project Manager Malloy waived it for each shuttle flight after July 10, 1985. Mr. Malloy and Mr. Lawrence Ware outlined the procedure in the following manner. Chairman Rogers, to you, what does a constraint mean then? Mr. Malloy, a launch constraint means that we have to address the observations, see if we have seen anything on the previous flight that changes our previous rationale, and address that at the flight readiness review. Chairman Rogers, when you say address it, I always get confused by the word. Do you mean think about it? Is that what you mean? Mr. Malloy, no, sir, I mean present the data as to whether or not what we have seen in our most recent observation, which may not be the last flight, it may be the flight before that, is within our experience base, and whether or not the previous analysis and tests that previously concluded that was an acceptable situation is still valid, based upon later observations. The constraint was put on after we saw the secondary O-ring erosion on the nozzle, I believe. Chairman Rogers, who decided that? Mr. Malloy, I decided that, that that would be addressed. Until that problem was resolved, it would be considered a launch constraint and addressed at flight readiness reviews to assure that we were staying within our test experience base. Chairman Rogers, do you have ultimate responsibility for waiving the launch constraints? Mr. Malloy, yes, sir. I have ultimate responsibility for the launch readiness of the solid rocket boosters. Chairman Rogers. So there was a launch constraint, and you waived it. Mr. Malloy. Yes, sir. All flights subsequent to. Dr. Ride. I'm trying to understand how you deal with the launch constraint. How important do you think a launch constraint is, and how unusual is it in your system? Mr. Ware. I think a launch constraint is a significant event in our system and it is one that has to be addressed within the flight readiness cycle because I don't have the authority to not do that. Dr. Ride, why didn't you put a launch constraint on the field joint at the same time? Mr. Malloy, I think at that point, and I will react to that question in real time, because I haven't really thought about it, but I think the logic was that we had been observing the field joint, the field and nozzle joint primary O-ring erosion. This erosion of a secondary O-ring was a new and significant event, very new and significant, even that we certainly did not understand. Everything up to that point had been that the primary O-ring, even though it had experienced some erosion, does seal. What we had evidence of was that here was a case where the primary O-ring was violated, and the secondary O-ring was eroded, and that was considered to be a more serious observation than previously observed. Dr. Ride. Correct me if I'm wrong, but weren't you basing most of your decisions on the field joint on analysis of what was the maximum, what you believed to be the maximum possible erosion, and you had that analysis for the field joint and for the nozzle joint? When you saw the complete erosion of the primary O-ring on the nozzle joint, that showed you that your analysis on the nozzle joint wasn't any good, 
I would think. That would indicate to you that your analysis on the field joint wasn't very good either, or at least should be suspect. Mr. Malloy. The conclusion, rightly or wrongly, for the cause of the secondary O-ring erosion on the nozzle joint, it was concluded from test data we had that 100 PSI pressurization leak check, that the putty could mask a primary O-ring that was not sealing. The conclusion was, and that one was done at 100 PSI, the conclusion was that in order to get that type of erosion that we saw in the primary O-ring, that that O-ring never sealed, and therefore the conclusion was that it never was capable of sealing. The leak check on subsequent nozzles, all subsequent nozzles, was run at 200 PSI, which the test data indicated would always blow through the putty, and in always blowing through the putty, we were guaranteed that we had a primary O-ring seal that was capable of sealing, and then we further did, and we already had that on the field joints at that time. While Malloy and Ware both testified that the constraint was still in effect and waived for Challenger's flight, they told the Commission that there had been two erroneous entries on the O-ring erosion nozzle problem assessment report, stating the O-ring erosion problem had been resolved or closed. Thiokol had suggested this closure on December 10, 1985, at Marshall's request, according to Brian Russell, but Ware and Malloy told the Commission they rejected that recommendation and the problem was still being addressed in flight readiness reviews. NASA Levels 1 and 2 apparently did not realize Marshall had assigned a launch constraint within the problem assessment system. This communication failure was contrary to the requirement, contained in the NASA Problem Reporting and Corrective Action Requirement System that launch constraints were to be taken to Level 2. Escalating Concerns When the burn-through of the primary nozzle O-ring on the left solid rocket booster of STS-51-B was discovered in Utah on June 25, 1985, an engineer from the NASA Headquarters Shuttle Propulsion Group was on the scene. Three days after the 51-B inspection, a memorandum was written to Michael Weeks, also at headquarters, reporting on the primary O-ring burn-through. The memo blamed the problem on the faulty 100 PSI leak check and reminded Weeks that Thiokol had not yet responded to the O-ring erosion action item sent out after STS-41-B one year earlier. Engineers at Thiokol also were increasingly concerned about the problem. On July 22, 1985, Roger Boisdoli of the Structures Section wrote a memorandum predicting NASA might give the motor contract to a competitor or there might be a flight failure if Thiokol did not come up with a timely solution. Nine days later, July 31, Boyce Jolie wrote another memorandum titled O-Ring Erosion Potential Failure Criticality to R.K. Lund, Thiokol's Vice President of Engineering. The mistakenly accepted position on the joint problem was to fly without fear of failure and to run a series of design evaluations which would ultimately lead to a solution or at least a significant reduction of the erosion problem. This position is now changed as a result of the 51-B nozzle joint erosion, which eroded a secondary O-ring with the primary O-ring never sealing. If the same scenario should occur in a field joint, and it could, then it is a jump ball whether as to the success or failure of the joint because the secondary O-ring cannot respond to the clevis opening rate and may not be capable of pressurization. The result would be a catastrophe of the highest order, loss of human life. Boisterly recommended setting up a team to solve the O-ring problem and concluded by stating, It is my honest and very real fear that if we do not take immediate action to dedicate a team to solve the problem, with the field joint having the number one priority, then we stand in jeopardy of losing a flight, along with all the launch pad facilities. In reply to specific questions from Marshall on August 9, Thiokol's Brian Russell reported the test data on the June 3 resiliency tests. As noted previously, he indicated O-ring resiliency was a function of the temperature and case expansion. Also, he wrote, Thiokol had no reason to suspect that the primary O-ring would fail after motor ignition transient. He said the secondary O-ring would seal within the period after ignition from 0 to 170 milliseconds. From 170 to 330 milliseconds, 
the probability of the sealing of the second O-ring was reduced. From 330 to 600 milliseconds, there was only a slight chance the secondary seal would hold. On August 19, 1985, Thiokol and Marshall program managers briefed NASA headquarters on erosion of the motor pressure seals. The briefing paper concluded that the O-ring seal was a critical matter, but it was safe to fly. The briefing was detailed, identifying all prior instances of field joint, nozzle joint, and igniter O-ring erosion. It recommended an accelerated pace to eliminate seal erosion, but concluded with the recommendation that it is safe to continue flying existing design as long as all joints are leak-checked with the 200 PSIG stabilization pressure, are free of contamination in the seal areas, and meet O-ring squeeze requirements. The briefing conclusions and recommendations appear in Figure 5. Figure 5. August 19, 1985 Headquarters Briefing. General Conclusions and Recommendations. General Conclusions. All O-ring erosion has occurred where gas paths in the vacuum putty are formed. Gas paths in the vacuum putty can occur during assembly, leak check, or during motor pressurization. Improved filler materials or layup configurations, which still allow a valid leak check of the primary O-rings, may reduce frequency of O-ring erosion, but will probably not eliminate it or reduce the severity of erosion. Elimination of vacuum putty in a tighter joint area will eliminate O-ring erosion if circumferential flow is not present. If it is present, some baffle arrangement may be required. Erosion in the nozzle joint is more severe due to eccentricity. However, the secondary seal in the nozzle will seal and will not erode through. The primary O-ring in the field joint should not erode through, but if it leaks due to erosion or lack of sealing, the secondary seal may not seal the motor. The igniter Gasco seal design is adequate providing proper quality inspections are made to eliminate overfill conditions. Recommendations The lack of a good secondary seal in the field joint is most critical, and ways to reduce joint rotation should be incorporated as soon as possible to reduce criticality. The flow conditions in the joint areas during ignition and motor operation need to be established through cold flow modeling to eliminate O-ring erosion. QM-5 static test should be used to qualify a second source of the only flight certified joint filler material, asbestos-filled vacuum putty, to protect the flight program schedule. VLS-1 should use the only flight certified joint filler material, Randolph asbestos-filled vacuum putty, in all joints. Additional hot and cold subscale tests need to be conducted to improve analytical modeling of O-ring erosion problem and for establishing margins of safety for eroded O-rings. Analysis of existing data indicates that it is safe to continue flying existing design as long as all joints are leak-checked with the 200 PSIG stabilization pressure, are free of contamination in the seal areas, and meet O-ring squeeze requirements. Efforts need to continue at an accelerated pace to eliminate SRM seal erosion. End of Figure 5 Thiokol's Robert Lund, Vice President Engineering, noting that the result of a leak at any of the joints would be catastrophic, announced the establishment of a Thiokol O-ring task force on August 20, 1985, to investigate the solid rocket motor case and nozzle joints, both materials and configurations, and recommend both short-term and long-term solutions. Two days later, A.R. Thompson, Thiokol's Supervisor of Structure Design, said in a memorandum to S.R. Stein, Project Engineer, that the O-ring seal problem has lately become acute. Thompson recommended near-term solutions of increasing the thickness of shims used at the tang and clevis mating, and increasing the diameter of the O-ring. Several long-term solutions look good, but several years are required to incorporate some of them, Thompson wrote. The simple short-term measures should be taken to reduce flight risks. During a commission hearing, Thompson was asked about the larger diameter O-ring solution. Dr. Walker, why didn't you go to the larger O-ring then? Mr. Thompson, one problem in going to larger O-rings is in field joints, plant joints, 
Excuse me. In the plant joints, if you put in the 295 and you take the worst on worst, when the joint is raised to a temperature of 325 degrees during the curing of the insulation, it is an overfill condition because of the alpha problems with the case and the rubber. Dr. Walker, there is no reason why a field joint and a plant joint had to have the same O-ring, is there? Mr. Thompson, there were some that were afraid of the QC people, that were afraid of the confusion that might be developed between two nearly the same sized O-ring. Thiokol's revised O-ring protection plan, dated August 30, 1985, indicated that NASA and Thiokol were still not in agreement on the magnitude of the joint rotation phenomenon. It said that, presently there are conflicting data from solid rocket motor case hydrotest and static test concerning the magnitude of case field joint rotation under motor pressure. A referee test will be devised, which is mutually acceptable to NASA and Thiokol, to determine joint opening characteristics. End of section 14. Recording by Marwak. Section 15 of Report to the President by the Presidential Commission on the Space Shuttle Challenger Accident. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Michael, Sussex, Wisconsin, USA, January 2021. Report to the President by the Presidential Commission on the Space Shuttle Challenger Accident, Section 15. Design Questions Resurface Also in late August, Thiokol submitted Preliminary Solid Rocket Motor Nozzle Field Joint Seal Concepts to NASA, which were formulated to solve the solid rocket motor sealing problems. The document contained 43 possible design concepts for field joints and 20 for nozzle joints. The report said Thiokol, quote, feels the case field joint poses the greatest potential risk in that its secondary seal may not maintain metal contact throughout motor operation. The nozzle joint is also of major concern because the frequency and severity of seal damage experienced has been greater than any other joint, end quote. In September 1985, Thiokol's plans called for test firing a static motor with various O-ring configurations. In a September 10 presentation to Marshall, Thiokol discussed erosion predictions and evaluated primary engineering concerns including joint deflection and secondary O-ring resiliency. Temperature was not mentioned. Prior to that Thiokol presentation, Marshall Science and Engineering Director Kingsbury had informed Solid Rocket Booster Program Manager Malloy, quote, I am most anxious to be briefed on plans for improving the solid rocket motor O-ring seals. Specifically, I want to review plans which lead to flight qualifications and the attendant schedules. I have been apprised of general ongoing activities, but these do not appear to carry the priority which I attach to the situation. I consider the O-ring seal problem on the solid rocket motor to require priority attention of both Morton Thiokol, Wasatch, and MSFC." End quote. Early in October, internal warnings about the lack of results from the O-ring task force came when Thiokol's management got two separate memoranda complaining about administrative delays and lack of cooperation. One memorandum was written by Roger Boisjolly on October 4, 1985, and it warned Thiokol management about lack of management support of the O-ring team's efforts. He said that, quote, even NASA perceives that the team is being blocked in its engineering efforts to accomplish its task. NASA is sending an engineering representative to stay with us starting October 14th. We feel that this is in direct result of their feeling that we, Thiokol, are not responding quickly enough on the SEAL problem. End quote. R. V. Ebling manager of Thiokol's solid rocket motor ignition system, began his October 1, 1985 report to McDonald with the alarming word, help. Ebeling said the SEAL task force was, quote, constantly being delayed by every possible means, end quote. 
Marshall Space Flight Center, he said, is correct in stating that we do not know how to run a development program. Ebeling continued, the allegiance to the O-Ring Investigation Task Force is very limited to a group of engineers numbering 8 to 10. Our assigned people in manufacturing and quality have the desire, but are encumbered with other significant work. Others in manufacturing, quality, procurement, who are not involved directly, but whose help we need, are generating plenty of resistance. We are creating more instructional paper than engineering data. We wish we could get action by verbal request, but such is not the case. This is a red flag." End quote. Shuttle Flight 61A was launched October 30, 1985. It experienced nozzle O-ring erosion and field joint O-ring blow-by. These anomalies were not mentioned at the Level 1 Flight Readiness Review for Flight 61B. That flight was launched on November 26, 1985, and sustained nozzle O-ring erosion and blow-by. The following month, December, Thiokol's problem status report, which tracked the field joint erosion anomaly, stated that the O-ring task force had made one hot gas test and preliminary results indicated the test chamber needed to be redesigned. Mr. Eberling of Thiokol became so concerned about the gravity of the O-ring problem that he told fellow members of the SEAL task force that he believed Thiokol should not ship any more motors until the problem was fixed. In testimony before the commission, Ebeling said, Mr. Ebeling, well, I am a hydraulics engineer by profession, and O-rings and seals and hydraulics are very sacred, but for the most part, a hydraulics or pneumatics engineer controls the structure, the structural design, the structural deformation to make sure that this neat little part that is so critical is giving everything it needs to operate. In solid rocket motors, I have been there now pushing 25 years. They had a different attitude on O-rings when I came there. And it is not just thiacol, it is universal. Dr. Covert, by universal, you mean the solid rocket industry? Mr. Eberling, the entire solid rocket industry. It gets around from one, the competitor's information eventually gets to me by one track or another, and mine to them. But my experience on O-rings was and is to this date that the O-ring is not a mechanism and never should be a mechanism that sees the heat of the magnitude of our motors. And I think before I do retire, I'm going to make sure that we discontinue to fly with round seals, which I am against round seals anyway. I think seals with memories, not pressure activated, but energized through mechanical means, and in all cases, keep the heat of our rocket motors away from those seals. Whatever it is, you do not need chamber pressure to energize a seal. Dr. Covert, in this regard then, did you have an increasing concern as you saw the tendency first to accept thermal distress, and then to say, well, we can model this reasonably, and we can accept a little bit of erosion, and then et cetera, et cetera. Did this cause you a feeling of, if not distress, then betrayal in terms of your feeling about O-rings? Mr. Eberling, I'm sure sorry you asked that question. Mr. Covert, I'm sorry I had to. Mr. Eberling, to answer your question, yes. In fact, I have been an advocate I used to sit on the O-ring task force and was involved in the SEALs since Brian Russell worked directly for me, and I had a certain allegiance to this type of thing anyway, that I felt that we shouldn't ship any more rocket motors until we got it fixed. Dr. Covert, did you voice this concern? Mr. Eberly, unfortunately, not to the right people. The Closure Issue on December 6, 1985, Thiokol's Brian Russell wrote Al McDonald, Thiokol's Solid Rocket Motor Project Director, requesting, quote, closure of the solid rocket motor O-ring erosion critical problems, end quote. He gave 17 reasons for the closure, including test results, future test plans, and the work to date of Thiokol's task force. Four days later, December 10, McDonald wrote a memorandum to NASA's WARE asking for closure of the O-ring problem. 
all O-ring erosion problems, including the problem containing the July 1985 launch constraint, were among the referenced matters that Thiokol suggested should be closed. McDonald noted that the O-ring problem would not be fully resolved for some time, and he enclosed a copy of Thiokol's August 30 plan for improving the motor seals. Brian Russell described the problem tracking process and gave the reason for the closure recommendation during the following exchange. Mr. Russell, we have our reliability engineering department who is responsible to complete the monthly problem report. And in addition to that, we have our monthly problem review board telephone conference with NASA and the contractors of which we are a part and the monthly problem review or the monthly problem report that reliability prepares they get the information from engineering or from the office as necessary to complete their status of what has happened during that month, whether the problem originated that month or what has been done to close that problem out. And that is submitted every month. And I, for one, do review that before it is submitted to the Marshall Space Flight Center. And so much of the information that I would read in these reports would be the same information that we had given in that monthly problem report or over the telephone on the teleconference. Chairman Rogers, Mr. Russell, when you say close the problem out, what do you mean by that? How do you close it out normally? Mr. Russell, normally, whether it takes engineering analysis or tests or some corrective action, a closeout to the problem would occur after an adequate corrective action had been taken to satisfy those on the problem review board that the problem had indeed been closed out. That is the way that that happens. For example, we had found a loose bolt on the recovery one time, and we had to take corrective action in our procedures and in the engineering to make sure that that wouldn't happen again, and then to verify that corrective action and at that point that the problem would be ready to be closed out. It generally involves a report or at least a mention by the review board stating what had been done to adequately close it out, and then it is agreed upon by the parties involved. Question. What do you understand a launch constraint to mean? Mr. Russell. My understanding of a launch constraint is that the launch cannot proceed without adequately without everyone's agreement that the problem is under control. Chairman Rogers. Under control meaning what? You just said a moment ago that you would expect some corrective action to be taken. Mr. Russell. That is correct. And in this particular case, on this 51B nozzle O-ring erosion problem, there had been some corrective action taken and that was included in the presentation made as a special addendum to the next flight readiness review. And at the time we did agree to continue to launch, which apparently had lifted the launch constraint, would be my understanding. Chairman Rogers, but really my question is, did you gentlemen realize that it was a launch constraint? Mr. Russell, I would like to answer for myself. I didn't realize that there was a formal launch constraint on this one, any different than some of the other erosion and blow-by that we had seen in the past. Mr. Eberling, I agree. Question. Mr. Russell, you wrote a letter, did you not, or a memorandum indicating that the problem should be closed. Could you explain to the commission what you meant by that? Mr. Russell, yes. In our December telephone call on the Problem Review Board, and I can't remember the date, it was around the 9th or so, there was a request to close the problems out, and particularly the ones that had been open for a long time, of which this was one. And a long time meaning six months or more. There was a request from the Director of Engineering, as I recall it, that we close these problems out. Dr. Walker. That was the Director of Engineering at Marshall? Mr. Russell. Yes, at Marshall Space Flight Center. Now, he wasn't in that call. My understanding is that they told us, and my recollection was that Mr. Kingsbury would like to see these problems closed out. Now, the normal method of closing them out is to implement the corrective action, verify the corrective action, 
and then the problem is closed. It comes off the board and is no longer under active review. Chairman Rogers. What was being done to fix it? Mr. Russell. Well, we had a task force created of full-time people at Thiokol, of which I was a member of that task team, and we had done some engineering tests. We were trying to develop concepts. We had developed some concepts to block the flow of hot gas against the O-ring to the point where the O-ring would no longer be damaged in a new configuration. And we had run some cold gas tests and some hot gas motor firing tests and were working toward a solution of the problem and we had some meetings scheduled with the Marshall Space Flight Center. We had weekly telephone calls where we statused our progress and there was a team at Marshall, also of engineering people, who were monitoring the things that we were doing to fix the problem with the goal of implementing a fix in our qualification motor number five, which was scheduled at that time in January, this time frame being about the December time frame of last year. Chairman Rogers, can I interrupt? So you're trying to figure out how to fix it, right? And you're doing some things to try to help you figure out how to fix it. Now, why at that point would you close it out? Mr. Russell, because I was asked to. Chairman Rogers, I see. Well, that explains it. Mr. Rummel, it explains it, but really doesn't make any sense. On one hand, you close out items that you've been reviewing flight by flight that have obviously critical implications. On the basis that after you close it out, you're going to continue to try to fix it. So I think what you're really saying is you're closing it out because you don't want to be bothered. Somebody doesn't want to be bothered with flight by flight reviews, but you're going to continue to work on it after it's closed out. Marshall received the Thiokol letter asking for the closure and entry was placed on all Marshall problem reports referenced in McDonald's December 10 letter indicating, quote, contractor closure received, end quote, on December 18, 1985. On January 23, 1986, another entry was placed on the same reports indicating the, quote, problem is considered closed, end quote. Lawrence Malloy and Lawrence Ware testified those entries were, quote unquote, in error. They said, Mr. Malloy, the problem assessment system was put in place to provide visibility throughout the shuttle system for the types of problems that do occur, not just in flight, but also in qualification tests and in failure of hardware that is back for refurbishment at a vendor or whatever. And it is a closed loop tracking system that lists the anomaly. Now the entry that is shown in there that the problem was closed prior to 51L is in error. What happened there was one of your documents here, which we did not discuss, is the letter from Mr. McDonald to Mr. Ware, which proposed that this problem be dropped from the problem assessment system and no longer be tracked for the reasons stated in Mr. McDonald's letter. That letter was in the review cycle. The letter, I believe, was dated 10 December 1985. It came into the center. It was in the review cycle. After Mr. Ware brought this letter to my attention, my reaction was, we are not going to drop this from the problem assessment system because the problem is not resolved and it has to be dealt with on a flight by flight basis. Since that was going through the review cycle, the people who run this problem assessment system erroneously entered a closure for the problem on the basis of the submittal from Thiokol. Having done that then for the 51L review, this did not come up in the flight readiness review as an open launch constraint. So you won't find a project signature because the PAS system showed the problem was closed and that was an error. Chairman Rogers. Who made the error, do you know? Mr. Malloy. The people who do the problem assessment system. Mr. Ware. Mr. Fletcher, and he reports within our quality organization at the flight readiness reviews, as I think have been described to you before. There is one from Thiokol to me, and there is one from my group to Larry, and then Larry, of course, does one with the shuttle project office 
and so forth on up the line. At my review and at Larry's review, here is a heads up given to the quality representative at the board for what problems the system has open. And they cross check to make sure that we address that problem in the readiness review. On this particular occasion, there was no heads up given because their problem assessment system considered that action closed. That is unfortunate. Project Manager Malloy was asked during the commission hearings about the original response to the O-ring erosion. Mr. Holtz. Mr. Malloy, I would like to understand this in somewhat simpler terms than you people are used to using. Is it correct to state that when you originally designed this joint and looked at it, that you did not anticipate erosion of any of the O-ring during flights? Mr. Malloy. That is my understanding. I entered this program in November of 1982, and I wasn't there on the original design of the joint, but when I took over the program, there was no O-ring erosion anticipated. Mr. Holtz. So that when you did run into signs of O-ring erosion, this was a bad sign. Mr. Malloy. Yes, sir. Mr. Holtz. So then you decided to introduce a standard based on the measurement or the possibility of the limits of O-ring erosion. And as those limits, as the experience went up, your criteria for, say, flight went up too. In other words, when you experienced more than maximum anticipated O-ring erosion, you waived the flight and said, well, it's possible to tolerate that. We still have a margin left. Mr. Malloy. Are you speaking of the case where we did not have a primary seal? Mr. Holtz, yes. Mr. Malloy, yes, sir, that is correct. Mr. Holtz, then you finally, you're talking about these margins of safety. And I wonder if you could express in either percentages or actual measurement terms. You have used the term, quote unquote, wide margin. I wonder if you could give us a quantitative measurement as to what you consider a wide margin. Mr. Malloy. Yes, sir. Well, as I said, we had demonstrated that we could stand 125 thousandths of erosion and still seat. The maximum erosion that we had seen in the case joint was on STS-2, which was 53 thousandths. So that is a factor of two and a half. Dr. Keel, I think, Larry, if you go back and look at your flight readiness reviews, that you were relying on less margins than that. You were arguing in the flight readiness reviews, where you briefed the problems of primary O-ring erosion, that for the worst case, for the field joint, also that it would be 90 thousandths. Mr. Malloy, that is correct. Dr. Keel, at that point, you were pointing out that's okay because you can seal at 95, not at 125, but at 95. It wasn't until later on during the process that you determined you could seal at 125. Mr. Malloy, that is when we got the hot gas test data. Dr. Keel, so that's a 5% margin, roughly, five and a half. Mr. Malloy, on the 90 to 95 on the max predictable. Yes. Temperature effects. The record of the fateful series of NASA and Thiokol meetings, telephone conferences, notes, and facsimile transmissions on January 27th, the night before the launch of Flight 51L, shows that only limited consideration was given to the past history of O-ring damage in terms of temperature. The managers compared, as a function of temperature, the flights for which thermal distress of O-rings had been observed, not the frequency of occurrence based on all flights. In such a comparison, there is nothing irregular in the distribution of O-ring distress over the spectrum of joint temperatures at launch between 53 degrees Fahrenheit and 75 degrees Fahrenheit. When the entire history of flight experience is considered, including normal flights with no erosion or blow-by, the comparison is substantially different. 
This comparison of flight history indicates only three incidents of O-ring thermal distress occurred out of 20 flights with O-ring temperatures at 66 degrees Fahrenheit or above, whereas all four flights with O-ring temperatures at 63 degrees Fahrenheit or below experienced O-ring thermal distress. Consideration of the entire launch temperature history indicates that the probability of O-ring distress is increased to almost a certainty if the temperature of the joint is less than 65. Flight Readiness Reviews It is clear that contractor and NASA program personnel all believe that the O-ring erosion blow-by anomaly and even the launch constraint were problems that should be addressed in NASA's flight readiness review process. The flight readiness review is a multi-tiered review that is designed to create an information flow from the contractor up through level three at Marshall, then to level two officials from Johnson and level one at headquarters. With regard to solid rocket booster, the process begins at the element level and culminates in a coordinated Marshall position at subsequent levels two and one flight readiness review. NASA policy manuals list four objectives of the shuttle project's flight readiness review. An intermediate review between level three and level one, when contractors and level three program personnel consider the upcoming launch. The stated objectives are, one, to provide the review team sufficient information necessary for them to make an independent judgment regarding flight readiness. Two, review solved problems and previous flight anomalies and establish confidence in solution rationale. Three, address all problems, technical issues, open items, and constraints requiring resolution before flight. Four, establish flight baseline configuration particularly as it differs from previous missions. The Commission has reviewed the various documentary presentations made by Thiokol and NASA program people for flight readiness reviews on all shuttle flights. The O-ring presentations in those flight readiness reviews have been summarized in an appendix to this report. The erosion on STS-2 was not considered on any level of flight readiness review for STS-3. Similarly, the heat effect on STS-6's primary O-ring in the nozzle was not mentioned on the STS-7 flight readiness review in 1983. However, the rationale for acceptance of the secondary seal condition for the lightweight case first flown on STS-6 contained the observation that an O-ring sealed during the thiokol test under 3000 PSI, where 0.125 inches had been cut out of the O-ring. The inattention to erosion and blow-by anomaly changed when Thiokol filed a problem report on the field joint erosion after STS-41B. The O-ring problems, field and nozzle, on 41B were briefed as a technical issue in the 41C flight readiness review. Probable causes were defined as putty blow-through at ignition causes cavity between putty and primary O-ring to fill during pressurization, inability of putty to withstand motor pressure, air entrapment in putty during mating, blow holes in putty during joint leak test. Thiokol presented the question at its 41C pre-board to Marshall, quote, if primary O-ring allowed a hot gas jet to pass through, would the secondary O-ring survive impingement?" End quote. At the 41C Level 1 Flight Readiness Review on March 30, 1984, Marshall said the erosion phenomena was quote-unquote acceptable, and that blowholes in the putty were the quote, most probable cause, end quote. The rationale for acceptance of the possibility of erosion on STS-41C was conservative analysis indicates max erosion possible 0 0.090 inches for field joint, 0 0.090 inches nozzle joint. Laboratory test of full-scale O-ring joint cross-section shows capability to sustain joint sealing integrity 
at 3000 PSI pressure using an O-ring with a simulated 0.095 inch erosion depth. Recommendation, fly STS-41C, accepting possibility of some O-ring gas impingement. The next significant treatment of the problem occurred after the coldest flight, 51C, at 53 degrees in January 1985. In part, Thiokol's extensive analysis for the 51E flight readiness review was due to the fact that four joints on 51C had problems. Additionally, Mr. Malloy's specific request for a recap of O-ring history undoubtedly prompted a full treatment. Temperature was highlighted as a concern when Malloy took Thiokol's analysis up to the Shuttle Project's Office Flight Readiness Review. That 18-page brief concluded with the statement that STS-51C consistent with erosion data based. Low temperature enhanced probability of blow-by. STS-51C experienced worst case temperature change in Florida history. STS-51E could exhibit the same behavior. Condition is acceptable. At the Level 1 Flight Readiness Review for 51E on February 21, 1985, the previous 18-page analysis had been reduced to a one-page chart with the resolution, quote, acceptable risk because of limited exposure and redundancy. Reference STS 41C FRR. No mention of temperature was found in the level one report. The last major discussion of erosion was at the level one flight readiness review for STS 51F, July 2, 1985. An analysis of failure of the nozzle primary O-ring to seal during the erosion on flight STS-51B, April 29, 1985, was presented. This serious erosion was attributed to leak check procedures. An increase in the nozzle leak check to 20 PSI was proposed to be a cure. There was no mention of the fact that 0.171 inches of erosion on the primary O-ring far exceeded a more recent analysis model prediction of 0.070 inches maximum possible erosion. This was a revision of the former prediction of 0.090 inches. The launch constraint activated after STS-51B was not specifically listed in the Level 1 Flight Readiness Review for 51F. The Commission has also not found any mention of the Dooley 1985 constraint or its waiver for subsequent shuttle flights in any Flight Readiness Review briefing documents. The Commission's review of the Marshall and Thiokol documentary presentations at the various Flight Readiness Reviews revealed several significant trends. First, O-ring erosion was not considered early in the program when it first occurred. Second, when the program grew worse after STS-41B, the initial analysis of the program did not produce much research. Instead, there was an early acceptance of the phenomenon. Third, because of a belief that in-flight O-ring erosion was, quote-unquote, within the database of prior experience, Later flight readiness reviews gave a cursory review and often dismissed the recurring erosion as within, quote, acceptable or, quote, allowable limits. Fourth, both Thiokol and Marshall continued to rely on the redundancy of secondary O-ring long after NASA had officially declared that the SEAL was a non-redundant single-point failure. Finally, in 1985, when temperature became a major concern after STS-51C, and when the launch constraint was applied after 51B, NASA Levels 1 and 2 were not informed of these developments in the flight readiness review process. Findings The genesis of the Challenger accident, the failure of the joint of the right solid rocket motor, began with decisions made in the design of the joint and in the failure by both Thiokol and NASA's Solid Rocket Booster Project Office to understand and respond to facts obtained during testing. The Commission has concluded that neither Thiokol 
nor NASA responded adequately to internal warnings about faulty seal design. Furthermore, Thiokol and NASA did not make a timely attempt to develop and verify a new seal after the initial design was shown to be deficient. Neither organization developed a solution to the unexpected occurrences of O-ring erosion and blow-by, even though this problem was experienced frequently during the shuttle flight history. Instead, Thiokol and NASA management came to accept erosion and blow-by as unavoidable and an acceptable flight risk. Specifically, the Commission has found that, number one, the joint test and certification program was inadequate. There was no requirement to configure the qualifications test motor as it would be in flight, and the motors were static tested in a horizontal position, not in the vertical flight position. Two, prior to the accident, neither NASA nor Thiokol fully understood the mechanism by which the joint sealing action took place. Three, NASA and Thiokol accepted escalating risk, apparently because they, quote, got away with it the last time, unquote. As Commissioner Feynman observed, the decision-making was, quote, a kind of Russian roulette. The shuttle flies with O-ring erosion and nothing happens. Then it is suggested, therefore, that the risk is no longer so high for the next flights. We can lower our standards a little bit because we got away with it last time. You got away with it, but it shouldn't be done over and over again like that. End quote. Four, NASA's system for tracking anomalies for flight readiness reviews failed in that despite a history of persistent O-ring erosion and blow-by, flight was still permitted. It failed again in the strange sequence of six consecutive launch constraint waivers prior to 51L, permitting it to fly without any record of waiver or even an explicit constraint. Tracking and continuing only anomalies that are, quote, outside the database, unquote, of prior flight allowed major problems to be removed from and lost by the reporting system. Five, the O-ring erosion history presented to Level 1 at NASA headquarters in August 1985 was sufficiently detailed to require corrective action prior to the next flight. Six, a careful analysis of flight history of O-ring performance would have revealed that the correlation of O-ring damage and low temperature. Neither NASA nor Thiokol carried out such an analysis. Consequently, they were unprepared to properly evaluate the risks of launching the 51L mission in conditions more extreme than they had encountered before. End of section 15. Recording by John Michael, Sussex, Wisconsin, USA, January 2021. Section 16 of Report to the President by the Presidential Commission on the Space Shuttle Challenger Accident. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Report to the President by the Presidential Commission on the Space Shuttle Challenger Accident. Chapter 7. The Silent Safety Program. The Commission was surprised to realize, after many hours of testimony, that NASA's safety staff was never mentioned. No witness related the approval or disapproval of the reliability engineers, and none expressed the satisfaction or dissatisfaction of the quality assurance staff. No one thought to invite a safety representative or a reliability and quality assurance engineer to the January 27, 1986, teleconference between Marshall and Theocol. Similarly, there was no representative of safety on the mission management team that made key decisions during the countdown on January 28, 1986. The Commission is concerned about the symptoms that it sees. The unrelenting pressure to meet the demands of an accelerating flight schedule might have been adequately handled by NASA if it had insisted upon the exactingly thorough procedures that were its hallmark during the Apollo program. An extensive and redundant safety program comprising interdependent safety, reliability, and quality assurance functions existed during and after the lunar program, 
to discover any potential safety problems. Between that period and 1986, however, the program became ineffective. This loss of effectiveness seriously degraded the checks and balances essential for maintaining flight safety. On April 3, 1986, Arnold Aldrich, the Space Shuttle Program Manager, appeared before the Commission at a public hearing in Washington, D.C. He described five different communication or organization failures that affected the launch decision on January 28, 1986. Four of those failures relate directly to faults within the safety program. These faults include a lack of problem reporting requirements, inadequate trend analysis, misrepresentation of criticality and lack of involvement in critical discussions. A properly staffed, supported, and robust safety organization might well have avoided these faults and thus eliminated the communication failures. NASA has a safety program to ensure that the communication failures to which Mr. Aldrich referred do not occur. In the case of Mission 51L, that program fell short. NASA Safety Program the NASA Safety, Reliability, and Quality Assurance Program should play an important role in agency activities, for the three concerns indicated in the program title are its functions. In general terms, the program monitors the status of equipment, validation of design, problem analysis, and system acceptability. Each of these has flight safety implications. More specifically, safety includes the preparation and execution of plans for accident prevention, flight system safety, and industrial safety requirements. Within the shuttle program, safety analyses focus on potential hazards and the assessment of acceptable risks. Reliability refers to processes for determining that particular components and systems can be relied on to work as planned. One product of such processes is a critical items list that identifies how serious the failure of a particular item or system would be. Quality assurance is closely related to both safety and reliability. All NASA elements prepare plans and institute procedures to ensure that high standards of quality are maintained. To accomplish that goal, elements charged with responsibility for quality assurance establish procedural controls assess inspection programs, and participate in a problem identification and reporting system. The chief engineer at NASA headquarters has overall responsibility for safety, reliability, and quality assurance. The ability of the chief engineer to manage NASA's safety program is limited by the structure of safety, reliability, and quality assurance organizations within the agency. His limited staff of 20 persons includes only one who spends 25% of his time on shuttle maintainability, reliability, and quality assurance, and another who spends 10% of his time on these vital aspects of flight safety. At Johnson, a large number of government and contractor engineers support the safety, reliability, and quality assurance program, but needed expertise concerning martial hardware is absent. Thus, the effectiveness of the oversight responsibilities at Level 2 is limited. Kennedy has a myriad of safety, reliability, and quality assurance organizations. In most cases, these organizations report to supervisors who are responsible for processing. The clear implication of such a management structure is that it fails to provide the kind of independent role necessary for flight safety. At Marshall, the Director of Reliability and Quality Assurance reports to the Director of Science and Engineering, who oversees the development of shuttle hardware. Again, this results in a lack of independence from the producer of hardware and is compounded by reductions in manpower, the net bringing about a decrease in effectiveness which has direct implications for flight safety. Monitoring Safety Critical Items As part of the safety, reliability, and quality assurance effort, components of the shuttle system are assigned to criticality categories as follows. Criticality 1. Loss of life or vehicle if the component fails. Criticality 2. Loss of mission if the component fails. Criticality 3. All others. Criticality 1R. 
redundant components the failure of both could cause loss of life or vehicle criticality two are redundant components the failure of both could cause loss of mission the assignment of criticality follows a highly detailed analysis of each space shuttle component to determine the effect of various ways the component could fail this analysis always assumes the most adverse conditions with the most conservative assumptions any component that does not meet the failsafe design requirement is designated a criticality one item and must receive a waiver for use a critical items list is produced that contains information about all criticality one components the solid rocket booster critical items list entry for the field joint dated december seventeenth nineteen eighty two is an example of this process component criticality is related to test requirements and the operational maintenance requirements and specifications document published and maintained by level two at johnson for the orbiter the references from the critical items list to the requirements and specifications document are complete and traceable in both directions the solid rocket booster critical items list however does not include references to the requirements and specifications document such references would make the critical items list a more efficient management tool for tracking activities concerned with items critical for flight safety the next step in procedures documentation is the operations and maintenance instruction which develops the directives into step-by-step -step procedures used at kennedy by technicians inspectors and test personnel to accomplish each step of the hardware preparations for flight the current operations and maintenance instruction does not indicate the criticality level of components if the operations and maintenance instruction clearly indicated when the work to be performed related to a criticality one component all concerned would be alerted that a higher than normal level of care should be used the same point applies to production activities at thiokol where criticality should be directly incorporated into manufacturing quality planning problem reporting prior to nineteen eighty three level three was required to report all problems trends and problem closeout actions to level two lest the problem was associated with hardware that was not flight critical unfortunately this requirement was substantially reduced to include only those problems which dealt with common hardware items or physical interface elements the revision eliminated reporting on flight safety problems flight schedule problems and problem trends the change to the reporting requirements was signed by james b jackson jr for glenn lunny who was at the time manager of the national space transportation system level two manager the change was submitted by martin raines director of safety reliability and quality assurance at johnson with this action level two lost all insight into safety operational and flight schedule issues resulting from level three problems on may nineteenth nineteen eighty six mr raines wrote a memo in which he explained that the documentation change was made in an attempt to streamline the system since the old requirements were not productive for the operational phase of the shuttle program in retrospect it is still difficult to understand why the director of safety reliability and quality assurance at johnson initiated this action and it is even more difficult to understand why level two approved it a review of all level three monthly problem reports open problem list issued by marshall during nineteen eighty four through nineteen eighty five indicates that none was distributed to level two management from a lengthy list of recipients only a single copy was sent to johnson and that one was sent to an engineer in the flight control division mr aldrich's office and the entire johnson safety reliability and quality assurance directorate were not on the distribution list for the problem reports a rockwell international safety reliability and quality assurance contractor at johnson received a statistical summary of problem status but not the actual problems descriptions reporting of in-flight anomalies a second method of notifying level two of problems would have been through the in-flight anomaly reporting channels 
the identification and resolution of anomalies that occur during flight are addressed in space shuttle program directive thirty four e for the solid rocket booster the huntsville operations support center is charged with these activities as well as other evaluations and documentation of mission results the space shuttle project managers at kennedy johnson and marshall and the manager for systems integration are responsible for the implementation of this directive in their respective areas a letter dated october twentieth nineteen eighty one from the manager of the national space transportation system level two addressed flight anomaly resolution beginning with the sts two evaluations the enclosed new form and instructions outlined in enclosure one will be utilized for all official flight anomaly closeouts flight anomalies will be presented for review and closeout at the noon special prcb program requirements change board the briefing charts will be prepared by the project elements and should include a schematic slash graph slash sketch of the problem area this material along with the closeout form and appropriate signatures will become a part of the permanent closeout record enclosure two provides a sample of closeout material from sts one that would be acceptable your cooperation in this activity will be appreciated since o-ring erosion and blow-by were considered by marshall to be high anomalies the letter above would appear to require reporting by the solid rocket booster project office to level two however the sample closeout material attached to the nineteen eighty one letter was identified as pertaining to flight test the first four flights the nineteen eighty three change might well have been interpreted as superseding the nineteen eighty one lunny letter particularly since the program officially became operational in late nineteen eighty two the reporting of anomalies unexpected events or unexplained departures from past experience that occurred during mission performance is a key ingredient in any reliability and quality assurance program through accurate reporting careful analysis and thorough testing problems or recurrence of problems can be prevented in, in an effective program reporting analysis testing and implementation of corrective measures must be fully documented the level of management that should be informed is a function of the seriousness of the problem for criticality one equipment anomalies the communications must reach all levels of management highly detailed and specific procedures for reporting anomalies and problems are essential to the entire process the procedures must be understood and followed by all unfortunately nasa does not have a concise set of problem reporting requirements those in effect are found in numerous individual documents and there is little agreement about which document applies to a given level of management under a given set of circumstances for a given anomaly safety program failures the safety reliability and quality assurance program at marshall serves a dual role it is responsible for assuring that the hardware delivered for use on the space shuttle meets design specifications in addition it acts as a watchdog on the system to assure that sound engineering judgment is exercised in the use of hardware and in appraising hardware problems limited human resources and an organization that place reliability and quality assurance functions on the director of science and engineering reduce the capability of the watchdog role much of what follows concerns engineering judgments and decisions by engineers and managers at marshall and morton thiokol it is the validity of these judgments that the commission has examined closely in its watchdog role an effectively functioning safety reliability and quality assurance organization could have taken action to prevent the fifty one l accident in the discussion that follows various aspects of the solid rocket booster joint design issue discussed earlier will be reviewed in the context of safety reliability and quality assurance the critical issue discussed in detail elsewhere involves the o-rings installed to seal the booster joints trend data development of trend data and the possible relationships between problems is a standard and expected function of any reliability and quality assurance program 
as previously noted the history of problems with the solid rocket booster o-ring took an abrupt turn in january nineteen eighty four when an ominous trend began until that date only one field joint o-ring anomaly had been found during the first nine flights of the shuttle beginning with the tenth mission however and concluding with the twenty-fifth the challenger flight more than half of the missions experienced field joint o-ring blow-by or erosion of some kind in retrospect this trend is easily recognizable according to wiley bunn director of reliability and quality assurance at marshall i agree with you from my purview and quality but we had that data it was a matter of assembling that data and looking at it in the proper fashion had we done that the data just jumps off the page at you this striking change in performance should have been observed and perhaps traced to a root cause no such trend analysis was conducted while flight anomalies involving the o-rings received considerable attention at morton thiokol and at marshall the significance of the developing trend went unnoticed the safety reliability and quality assurance program of course exists to ensure that such trends are recognized when they occur a series of changes to solid rocket booster processing procedures at kennedy may be significant on-site o-ring inspections were discontinued o-ring leak check stabilization pressure on the field joint was increased to two hundred pounds per square inch from one hundred sometimes blowing holes through the protective putty the patterns for positioning the putty were changed the putty type was changed reuse of motor segment casings increased and a new government contractor began management of solid rocket booster assembly one of these developments or a combination of them was probably the cause of the higher anomaly rate the safety reliability and quality assurance program should have tracked and discovered the reason for the increasing erosion and blow-by the history of problems in the nozzle joint is similar to that of the solid rocket booster field joint while several of the changes mentioned above also could have influenced the frequency of nozzle o-ring problems the frequency correlates with leak check pressure to a remarkable degree again development of trend data is a standard and expected function of any reliability and quality assurance program even the most cursory examination of failure rates should have indicated that a serious and potentially disastrous situation was developing on all solid rocket booster joints not recognizing and reporting this trend can only be described in nasa terms as a quality escape a failure of the program to preclude an avoidable problem if the program had functioned properly the challenger accident might have been avoided the trend should have been identified and analyzed to discover the physical processes damaging the o-ring and thus jeopardizing the integrity of the joint a likely cause of the o-ring erosion appears to have been the increased leak check pressure that caused hazardous blow-holes in the putty such holes at booster ignition provided a ready path for combustion gases directly to the o-ring the blow-holes were known to be created by the higher pressure used in the leak check the phenomenon was observed and even photographed prior to a test firing in utah on may ninth nineteen eighty five in that particular case the grease from the o-ring was actually blown through the putty and was visible on the inside core of the solid rocket booster the trends of flight anomalies in relation to leak check stabilization pressure are illustrated for the field joint and the nozzle joint in figure three on page one thirty three while the data point concerning the one hundred pound per square inch field joint leak check is not conclusive since it is based only on two flights the trend is apparent management awareness during its investigation the commission repeatedly heard witnesses refer to redundancy in the solid rocket motor joint and argue over the criticality of the joint while the field joint has been categorized as a critical one item since nineteen eighty two page one fifty seven most of the problem reporting paperwork generated by thiokol and marshall listed it as a criticality one r perhaps leading some managers to believe wrongly that redundancy existed the problem assessment system operated by rockwell contractors at marshall which routinely updates the problem status 
still list at the field joint as criticality 1R on March 7, 1986, more than five weeks after the accident. Such misrepresentation of criticality must also be categorized as a failure of the safety, reliability, and quality assurance program. As a result, informed decision-making by key managers was impossible. Mr. Bunn, the Director of Reliability and Quality Assurance at Marshall, stated on April 7, 1986, but the other thing you will notice on those problem reports is that for some reason on the individual problem reports we kept sticking criticality 1R on them, and that is just a sheer quality escape. The Impact of Misinformation the manner in which misinformation influences top management has been illustrated by former associate administrator for space flight jesse moore and then we had a flight readiness review i guess in july getting ready for a mid-july or a late july flight and the action had come back from the project office i guess the level three had reported to the level two flight readiness review and then they reported up to me that they reported the two erosions on the primary o-ring and some ten or twelve percent erosion on the secondary o-ring on that flight in april and the corrective actions i guess that had been put in place was to increase the test pressure i think from fifty pounds per square inch to two hundred psi or one hundred psi i guess it was two hundred psi is the number and they felt that they had run a bunch of laboratory tests and analyses that showed that by increasing the pressure up to 200 psi this would minimize or eliminate the erosion and that there would be a fairly good degree of safety factor margin on the erosion as a result of increasing this pressure and ensuring that the secondary seal had been seated and so we left the frr flight readiness review with that particular action closed by the project not only was mr moore misinformed about the effectiveness and potential hazards associated with the long-used new procedures he also was misinformed about the issue of joint redundancy apparently no one told or reminded mr moore that while the solid rocket booster nozzle joint was criticality one r the field joint was criticality one no one told him about blowholes in the putty probably resulting from the increased stabilization pressure and no one told him that this new procedure had been in use since the exact time that field joint anomalies had been dangerously frequent at the time of this briefing the increased pressure already had been used on four solid rocket motor nozzle joints and all four had erosion erosion was the enemy and increased pressure was its ally while mr moore was not being intentionally deceived he was obviously misled the reporting system simply was not making trends, status, and problems visible with sufficient accuracy and emphasis. Reporting Launch Constraints The Commission was surprised to learn that a launch constraint had been imposed on the solid rocket booster. It was further surprised to learn that those outside of Marshall were not notified. Because of the seriousness of the mission, 51B nozzle o-ring erosion incident, launch constraints were placed against the next six shuttle flights a launch constraint arises from a flight safety issue of sufficient seriousness to justify a decision not to launch the initial problem description stated that based on the amount of charring the erosion paths on the primary o-ring and what is understood about the erosion phenomenon it is believed that the primary o-ring of s m r sixteen a the solid rocket motor on flight fifty one b never seated the maximum erosion depth was point one seven one inches on the primary o-ring and point zero three two inches on the secondary on february twelfth at a level three flight readiness review maximum expected erosion on nozzle joint o-rings had been projected as point zero seven inches for the primary and point zero zero four inches for the secondary thus the results far exceeded the maximum expected if the same ratio of actual to projected erosion were to occur on a field joint the erosion would be point two two five inches with secondary seal inadequacy as indicated by criticality one status that degree of erosion could result in joint failure 
and the loss of vehicle and crew the problem reporting and corrective action document j s c zero eight one two six a paragraph three point two d requires project offices to inform level two of launch constraints that requirement was not met neither level two nor level one was informed implications of an operational program following successful completion of the orbital flight test phase of the shuttle program the system was declared to be operational subsequently several safety reliability and quality assurance organizations found themselves with reduced and or reorganized functional capability included notably were the marshal offices where there was net attrition and nasa headquarters where there were several reorganizations and transfers the apparent reason for such actions was a perception that less safety reliability and quality assurance activity would be required during routine shuttle operations this reasoning was faulty the machinery is highly complex and the requirements are exacting the space shuttle remains a totally new system with little or no history as the system matures and the experience changes careful tracking will be required to prevent premature failures as the flight rate increased more hardware operations were involved and more total in-flight anomalies occurred tracking requirements became more rather than less critical because of implications for the next flight in an accelerating program two problems on mission sixty one c were not evaluated as part of the review process for the next flight fifty one l a serious failure of the orbital wheel brake was not known to the crew as mission fifty one l lifted off with a plan to make the first kennedy landing since a similar problem halted such operations in april nineteen eighty five secondly an o-ring erosion problem had occurred on mission sixty one c and while it had been discovered it had not been incorporated into the problem assessment system when mission fifty one l was launched if the program cannot come to grips with such critical safety aspects before subsequent flights are scheduled to occur it obviously is moving too fast or its safety reliability and quality assurance programs must be strengthened to provide more rapid response the inherent risk of the space shuttle program is defined by the combination of a highly dynamic environment enormous energies mechanical complexities time-consuming preparations and extremely time-critical decision-making complacency and failures in supervision and reporting seriously aggravate these risks rather than weaken safety reliability and quality assurance programs through attrition and reorganization nasa must elevate and strengthen these vital functions in addition nasa's traditional safety reliability and quality assurance efforts need to be augmented by an alert and vigorous organization that oversees the flight safety program aerospace safety advisory panel the aerospace safety advisory panel the panel and what follows was established in the aftermath of the apollo spacecraft fire january twenty seventh nineteen sixty seven shortly thereafter the united states congress enacted legislation section six of the nasa authorization act nineteen sixty eight forty two u s c two four seven seven to establish the panel as a senior advisory committee to nasa the statutory duties of the panel are the panel shall review safety studies and operations plans referred to it and shall make reports thereon shall advise the administrator with respect to the hazards of proposed operations and with respect to the adequacy of proposed or existing safety standards and shall perform such other duties as the administrator may request the panel membership is set by statute at no more than nine members of whom up to four may come from nasa the nasa chief engineer is an ex officio member the staff consists of full-time nasa employees and the staff director serves as both executive secretary and technical assistant to the panel the role of the panel has been defined and redefined by the members themselves nasa senior management and members of the house and senate of the u s congress the panel began to review the space shuttle program in nineteen seventy one and in its nineteen seventy four annual report it documented a shift in focus 
the panel feels that a broader examination of the programs and their management gives them more confidence than in limiting their inquiry to safety alone over ensuing years the panel continued to examine the space shuttle program including safety reliability and quality assurance systems redundancy flight controls and ground processing and handling though management issues continued to dominate their concerns following the first flight of the shuttle the panel investigated a wide variety of specific objects to include the lightweight external tank the centaur and inertial upper stage programs shuttle logistics and spare parts landing gear tires brakes solid rocket motor nozzles and the solid rocket motor using the filament wound case there is no indication however that the details of solid rocket booster joint design or in-flight problems were ever the subject of a panel activity the efforts of this panel were not sufficiently specific and immediate to prevent the fifty one l accident space shuttle program crew safety panel the space shuttle crew safety panel established by space shuttle program directive four a dated april seventeenth nineteen seventy four served an important function in nasa flight safety activities until it went out of existence in nineteen eighty one if it were still in existence it might have identified the kinds of problems now associated with the fifty one l mission the purpose of the panel was twofold one to identify possible hazards to shuttle crews and two to provide guidance and advice to shuttle program management concerning the resolution of such conditions the membership of the panel comprised ten representatives from johnson and a single representative each from dryden the nasa facility at edwards air force base california kennedy marshall and the air force the panel was to support the level two program requirements control board chaired by the project manager and recommendations were subject to control board approval from nineteen seventy four through nineteen seventy eight the panel met on a regular basis twenty four times and considered vital issues ranging from mission abort contingencies to equipment acceptability the membership of the panel from engineering project management and astronaut offices ensured a minimum level of safety communications among those organizations this ceased to exist when the panel effectively ceased to exist in nineteen eighty nasa had expected the panel to be functional only during the design development and flight test phases and to concern itself with all vehicle systems and operating modes when the original chairman scott h simpkinson retired in nineteen eighty one the panel was merged with a safety sub-panel that assumed neither the membership nor the functions of the safety panel after that time the nasa shuttle program had no focal point for flight safety the need for a new safety organization the aerospace safety advisory panel unquestionably has provided nasa a valuable service which has contributed to the safety of nasa's operations because of its breadth of activities however it cannot be expected to uncover all of the potential problems nor can it be charged with failure when accidents occur that in hindsight were clearly probable the ability of any panel to function effectively depends on a focused scope of responsibilities an acceptable level of operational safety coverage requires the total combination of nasa and contractor organizations working more effectively on a coordinated basis at all levels the commission believes therefore that a top-to-bottom emphasis on safety can best be achieved by a combination of a strong central authority and a working level panel devoted to the operational aspects of shuttle flight safety findings one reductions in the safety reliability and quality assurance workforce at marshall and nasa headquarters have seriously limited capability in those vital functions two organizational structures at kennedy and marshall have placed safety reliability and quality assurance offices under the supervision of the very organizations and activities whose efforts they are to check three problem reporting requirements are not concise and fail to get critical information to the proper levels of management four little or no trend analysis was performed on o-ring erosion and blow-by problems 
five as the flight rate increased the marshal's safety reliability and quality assurance workforce was decreasing which adversely affected mission safety six five weeks after the fifty one l accident the criticality of the solid rocket motor field joint was still not properly documented in the problem reporting system at marshall End of section sixteen section seventeen of report to the president by the presidential commission on the space shuttle challenger accident this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org report to the president by the presidential commission on the space shuttle challenger accident chapter eight pressures on the system part one with the 1982 completion of the Orbital Flight Test Series, NASA began a planned acceleration of the Space Shuttle launch schedule. One early plan contemplated an eventual rate of emission a week, but realism forced several downward revisions. In 1985, NASA published a projection calling for an annual rate of 24 flights by 1990. Long before the Challenger accident, however, it was becoming obvious that even the modified goal of two flights a month were overambitious. In establishing this schedule, NASA had not provided adequate resources for its attainment. As a result, the capacities of the system were strained by the modest nine-mission rate of 1985, and the evidence suggested that NASA would not have been able to accomplish the 15 flights scheduled for 1986. These are the major conclusions of a commission examination of the pressures and problems attendant upon the accelerated launch schedule. On the same day that the initial orbital tests concluded, July 4, 1982, President Reagan announced a national policy to set the direction of the U.S. space program during the following decade. As part of that policy, the president stated that the United States Space Transportation System the STS, is the primary space launch system for both national security and civil government missions. Additionally, he said the first priority of the STS program is to make the system fully operational and cost-effective in providing routine access to space. From the inception of the shuttle, NASA had been advertising a vehicle that would make space operations routine and economical. The greater the annual number of flights, the greater the degree of routinization and economy. So heavy emphasis was placed on the schedule. However, the attempt to build up to 24 missions a year brought a number of difficulties. Among them, the compression of training schedules, the lack of spare parts, and the focusing of resources on near-term problems. One effect of NASA's accelerated flight rate and the agency's determination to meet it, was the dilution of the human and material resources that could be applied to any particular flight. The part of the system responsible for turning the mission requirements and objectives into flight software, flight trajectory information, and crew training materials was struggling to keep up with the flight rate in late 1985, and forecasts showed it would be unable to meet its milestones for 1986. It was falling behind because its resources were strained to the limit, strained by the flight rate itself, and by the constant changes it was forced to respond to within that accelerating schedule. Compounding the problem was the fact that NASA had difficulty evolving from its single-flight focus to a system that could efficiently support the projected flight rate. It was slow in developing a hardware maintenance plan for its reusable fleet, and slow in developing the capabilities that would allow it to handle the higher volume of work and training associated with the increased flight frequency. Pressures developed because of the need to meet customer commitments, which translated into a requirement to launch a certain number of flights per year and to launch them on time. Such considerations may occasionally have obscured engineering concerns. Managers may have forgotten partly because of past successes, partly because of their own well-nurtured image of the program, 
that the shuttle was still in a research and development phase. In his testimony before a U.S. Senate Appropriations Subcommittee on May 5, 1982, following the third flight of the space shuttle, James Beggs, then the NASA Administrator, expressed NASA's commitment. The highest priority we have set for NASA is to complete the development of the shuttle and turn it into an operational system. Safety and reliability of flight and the control of operational costs are primary objectives as we move forward with the shuttle program. Sixteen months later, arguing in support of the space station, Mr. Beggs said, We can start any time. There's no compelling reason why it has to be 1985 rather than 86 or 87. The point that we have made is that the shuttle is now operational. The prevalent attitude in the program appeared to be that the shuttle should be ready to emerge from the developmental stage, and managers were determined to prove it operational. Various aspects of the mission design and development process were directly affected by that determination. The sections that follow will discuss the pressures exerted on the system by the flight rate, the reluctance to relax the optimistic schedule, and the attempt to assume an operational status. Planning of a Mission The planning and preparation for a space shuttle flight require close coordination among those making the flight manifest, those designing the flight, and the customers contracting NASA's services. The goals are to establish the manifest, define the objectives, constraints, and capabilities of the mission, and translate those into hardware, software, and flight procedures. There are major program decision points in the development of every shuttle flight. At each of these points, sometimes called freeze points, decisions are made that form the basis for further engineering and process development. The disciplines affected by these freeze points include integration hardware, engineering, crew timeline, flight design, and crew training. The first major freeze point is at launch minus 15 months. At that time, the flight is officially defined. The launch date, orbiter, and major payloads are all specified, and initial design and engineering are begun based on this information. The second major freeze point is at launch minus 7.7 months, the cargo integration review. During this review, the integration hardware design, orbiter vehicle configuration, flight design, and software requirements are agreed to and specified. Further design and engineering can then proceed. Another major freeze point is the flight planning and stowage review at launch minus five months. At that time, the crew activity timeline and the crew compartment configuration, which includes mid-deck payloads and Payload specialist assignments are established. Final design, engineering, and training are based on these products. Development of flight products. The production process begins by collecting all mission objectives, requirements, and constraints specified by the payload and space shuttle communities at the milestones described above. That information is interpreted and assimilated as various groups generate products required for a space shuttle flight, trajectory data, consumables requirements, orbital flight software, mission control center software, and the crew activity plan, to name just a few. Some of these activities can be done in parallel, but many are serial. Once a particular process has started, if a substantial change is made to the flight, not only does the process have to be started again, but the process that preceded it and supplied its data may also need to be repeated. If one group fails to meet its due date, the group that is next in the chain will start late. The delay then cascades through the system. Were the elements of the system meeting their schedules? Although each group believed it had an adequate amount of time allotted to perform its function, the system as a whole was falling behind. Graph depicts beginning of simulated training for shuttle crews in days before launch for missions 41B through 61E. An assessment of the system's overall performance is best made by studying the process at the end of the production chain, crew training. 
Analysis of training schedules for previous flights and projected training schedules for flights in the spring and summer of 1986 reveals a clear trend. Less and less time was going to be available for crew members to accomplish their required training. See the shuttle mission simulator training chart. The production system was disrupted by several factors, including increased flight rate, lack of efficient production processing, and manifest changes. Changes in the manifest. Each process in the production cycle is based on information agreed upon at one of the freeze points. If that information is later changed, the process may have to be repeated. The change could be a change in manifest or a change to the orbiter hardware or software. The hardware and software changes in 1985 usually were mandatory changes. Perhaps some of the manifest changes were not. The changes in the manifest were caused by factors that fall into four general categories. Hardware problems, customer requests, operational constraints, and external factors. The significant changes made in 1985 are shown in the accompanying table. The following examples illustrate that a single proposed change can have extensive impact, not because the change itself is particularly difficult to accommodate, though it may be, but because each change necessitates four or five other changes. The cumulative effect can be substantial. See the impact of manifest changes chart. When a change occurs, the program must choose a response and accept the consequences of that response. The options are usually to either maximize the benefit to the customer or to minimize the adverse impact on space shuttle operations. If the first option is selected, the consequences will include short-term and or long-term effects. Hardware problems can cause extensive changes in the payload manifest. The 51-E mission was on the launch pad, only days from launch, with a tracking and data relay satellite and telesat satellite in the cargo bay, when a hardware problem in the tracking satellite was discovered. The flight was canceled, and the payload reassigned. The cancellation resulted in major changes to several succeeding flights. Mission 51-D, scheduled to fly two months later, was changed to add the telesat and delete the retrieval of the long-duration exposure facility. The retrieval mission was then added to Mission 61-I, replacing another satellite. A new mission, 61-M, was scheduled for July 1986 to accommodate the tracking and data relay satellite and the displaced satellite, and all flights scheduled later in 1986 slipped to make room for 61-M. Customers occasionally have notified NASA headquarters of a desire to change the scheduled launch date because of development problems, financial difficulties, or changing market conditions. NASA generally accedes to these requests and has never imposed the penalties available. An example is the request made to delay the flight of the Westar satellite from Mission 61-C, December of 1985, to a flight in March 1986. Westar was added to Flight 61-E, and the Gateway Special Bridge Assembly was removed to make room for it. The HS-376 satellite slot was deleted from 51-L and added to 61-C. The Spartan-Haley satellite was deleted from 61-D and added to 51-L. Thus, four flights experienced major payload changes as a result of one customer's request. Hardware problems. Tracking and data relay satellite. Canceled 51-E, added 61-M. Synchronous communication satellite. Added to 61-C. Synchronous communication satellite. Removed from 61-C. OV-102 late delivery from Palmdale. Changed 251-G, 51-I, and 61-A. Customer Requests HS-376 removed from 51-I. G-Star removed from 61-C. 
Satellite Television Corporation Direct Broadcast Satellite, removed from 61-E. Westar, removed from 61-C. Satellite Television Corporation Direct Broadcast Satellite, removed from 61-H. Electrophoresis Operations in Space, removed from 61-B. Electrophoresis Operations in Space, removed from 61-H. Hubble Space Telescope, swap with Earth Observation Mission. Operational Constraints No launch window for Skynet Indian Satellite Combination, 61-H. Unacceptable structural loads for tracking in data relay satellite, Indian Satellite, 61-H. Landing weight above allowable limits for each of the following missions, 61-A, 61-E, 71-A, 61-K. External Factors Late Edition of Senator Jake Garn, A. Utah, 51-D. Late Edition of Representative Bill Nelson, D. Florida, 61-C. Late Edition of Physical Vapor Transport Organic Solid Experiment, 51-I. Graph shows that changes to the payload manifest for shuttle missions can boost Johnson's Space Center workload as much as 130%. Operational constraints, for example, a constraint on the total cargo weight, are imposed to ensure that the combination of payloads does not exceed the orbiter's capabilities. An example involving the Earth Observation Mission Space Lab flight is presented in the NASA Mission Planning and Operations Team Report in Appendix J. That case illustrates that changes resulting from a single instance of a weight constraint violation can cascade through the entire schedule. External factors have been the cause of a number of changes in the manifest as well. The changes discussed above involve major payloads, but changes to other payloads or to payload specialists can create problems as well. One small change does not come alone. It generates several others. A payload specialist was added to Mission 61-C only two months before its scheduled liftoff. Because there were already seven crew members assigned to the flight, one had to be removed. The use payload specialist was removed from 61-C to 51-L just three months before 51-L was scheduled to launch. His experiments were also added to 51-L. Two mid-deck experiments were deleted from 51-L as a result, and the deleted experiments would have reappeared on later flights. Graph depicts beginning of simulator training for shuttle crews in days before launch for missions 51-L through 61-K. Launch minus 77 days is normal training date start. Again, a single late change affected at least two flights, very late in the planning and preparation cycles. The effects of such changes in terms of budget, cost, and manpower can be significant. In some cases, the allocation of additional resources allows the change to be accommodated with little or no impact to the overall schedule. In those cases, steps that need to be redone can still be accomplished before their deadlines. The amount of additional resources required depends, of course, on the magnitude of the change and when the change occurs. Early changes, those before the cargo integration review, have only a minimal impact. Changes at launch minus five months, two months after the cargo integration review, can carry a major impact, increasing the required resources by approximately 30%. In the missions from 41-C to 51-L, only 60% of the major changes occurred before the cargo integration review. More than 20% occurred after launch minus five months and caused disruptive budget and manpower impacts. Engineering flight products are generated under a contract that allows for increased expenditures to meet occasional high workloads. Even with this built-in flexibility, however, the requested changes occasionally saturate facilities 
and personnel capabilities. The strain on resources can be tremendous. For short periods of two to three months in mid-1985 and early 1986, facilities and personnel were required to perform at roughly twice the budgeted flight rate. If a change occurs late enough, it will have an impact on the serial processes. In these cases, additional resources will not alleviate the problem, and the effect of the change is absorbed by all downstream processes, and ultimately by the last element in the chain. In the case of the flight design and software reconfiguration process, the last element is crew training. In January 1986, the forecasts indicated that crews on flights after 51-I would have significantly less time than desired to train for their flights. See the simulation training chart. According to astronaut Henry Hartsfield, had we not had the accident, we were going to be up against a wall. STS-61-H would have had to have averaged 31 hours in the simulator to accomplish their required training and STS-61-K would have to average 33 hours. That is ridiculous. For the first time, somebody was going to have to stand up and say, we have got to slip the launch because we are not going to have the crew trained. Operational Capabilities For a long time during shuttle development, the program focused on a single flight, the first space shuttle mission. When the program became operational, Flights came more frequently, and the same resources that had been applied to one flight had to be applied to several flights concurrently. Accomplishing the more pressing immediate requirements diverted attention from what was happening to the system as a whole. That appears to be one of the main telling differences between a research and development program and an operational program. Some of the differences are philosophical. Some are attitudinal and some are practical. Elements within the shuttle program try to adapt their philosophy, their attitude, and their requirements to the operational era. But that era came suddenly, and in some cases, there had not been enough preparation for what operational might entail. For example, routine and regular post-flight maintenance and inspections are critical in an operational program. Spare parts are critical to flight readiness in an operational fleet, and the software tools and training facilities developed during a test program may not be suitable for the high volume of work required in an operational environment. In many respects, the system was not prepared to meet an operational schedule. As the space shuttle system matured, with numerous changes and compromises, a comprehensive set of requirements was developed to ensure the success of a mission. What evolved was a system in which the pre-flight processing, flight planning, flight control, and flight training were accomplished with extreme care applied to every detail. This process checked and rechecked everything. And though it was both labor and time intensive, it was appropriate and necessary for a system still in the developmental phase. The process, however, was not capable of meeting the flight rate goals. After the first series of flights, the system developed plans to accomplish what was required to support the flight rate. The challenge was to streamline the processes through automation, standardization, and centralized management, and to convert from the developmental phase to the mature system without a compromise in quality. It required that experts carefully analyze their areas to determine what could be standardized and automated, then take the time to do it. But the increasing flight rate had priority. Quality products had to be ready on time. Further, schedules and budgets for developing the needed facility improvements were not adequate. Only the time and resources left after supporting the flight schedule, could be directed toward efforts to streamline and standardize. In 1985, NASA was attempting to develop the capabilities of a production system, but it was forced to do that while responding with the same personnel to a higher flight rate. At the same time the flight rate was increasing, 
A variety of factors reduced the number of skilled personnel available to deal with it. These included retirements, hiring freezes, transfers to other programs like the space station, and transitioning to a single contractor for operations support. The flight rate did not appear to be based on assessment of available resources and capabilities, and was not reduced to accommodate the capacity of the workforce. For example, on January 1, 1986, a new contract took effect at Johnson that consolidated the entire contractor workforce under a single company. This transition was another disturbance at a time when the workforce needed to be performing at full capacity to meet the 1986 flight rate. In some important areas, a significant fraction of workers elected not to change contractors. This reduced the workforce and its capabilities and necessitated intensive training programs to qualify the new personnel. According to projections, the workforce would not have been back to full capacity until the summer of 1986. This drain on a critical part of the system came just as NASA was beginning the most challenging phase of its flight schedule. Similarly, at Kennedy, the capabilities of the shuttle processing and facility support workforce became increasingly strained as the orbiter turnaround time decreased to accommodate the accelerated launch schedule. This factor had resulted in overtime percentages of almost 28% in some directorates. Numerous contract employees have worked 72 hours per week or longer and frequent 12-hour shifts. The potential implications of such overtime for safety were made apparent during the attempted launch of Mission 61-C on January 6, 1986, when fatigue and shift work were cited as major contributing factors to a serious incident involving a liquid oxygen depletion that occurred less than five minutes before scheduled liftoff. The issue of workload at Kennedy is discussed in more detail in Appendix G. Another example of a system designed during the developmental phase and struggling to keep up with operational requirements is the Shuttle Mission Simulator. There are currently two simulators. They support the bulk of a crew's training for ascent, orbit, and entry phases of a shuttle mission. Studies indicate two simulators can support no more than 12 to 15 flights per year. The flight rate at the time of the accident was about to saturate the system's capability to provide trained astronauts for those flights. Furthermore, the two existing simulators are out of date and require constant attention to keep them operating at capacity, to meet even the rate of 12 to 15 flights per year. Although there are plans to improve capability, funds for those improvements are minimal and spread out over a 10-year period. This is another clear demonstration that the system was trying to develop its capabilities to meet an operational schedule, but was not given the time, opportunity, or resources to do it. End of section 17. Section 18 of Report to the President by the Presidential Commission on the Space Shuttle Challenger Accident. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Report to the President by the Presidential Commission on the Space Shuttle Challenger Accident. Chapter 8. Pressures on the System, Part 2. Responding to Challenges and Changes. Another obstacle in the path toward accommodation of a higher flight rate is NASA's legendary can-do attitude. The attitude that enabled the agency to put the men on the moon and to build the space shuttle will not allow it to pass up an exciting challenge, even though accepting the challenge may drain resources from the more mundane but necessary aspects of the program. A recent example is NASA's decision to perform a spectacular retrieval of two communication satellites whose upper stage motors had failed to raise them to the proper geosynchronous orbit. NASA itself then proposed to the insurance companies who owned the failed satellites that the agency design a mission to rendezvous with them in turn and that an astronaut in a jet backpack fly over to escort the satellites into the shuttle's payload bay for a return to Earth. 
The mission generated considerable excitement within NASA and required a substantial effort to develop the necessary techniques, hardware, and procedures. The mission was conceived, created, designed, and accomplished within 10 months. The result, Mission 51-A, November 1984, was a resounding success, as both failed satellites were successfully returned to Earth. The retrieval mission vividly demonstrated the service that astronauts and the space shuttle can perform. Ten months after the first retrieval mission, NASA launched a mission to repair another communications satellite that had failed in low Earth orbit. Again, the mission was developed and executed on relatively short notice, and was resoundingly successful for both NASA and the satellite insurance industry. The satellite retrieval missions were not isolated occurrences. Extraordinary efforts on NASA's part in developing and accomplishing missions will and should continue, but such efforts will be a substantial additional drain on resources. NASA cannot both accept the relatively spur-of-the-moment missions that its can-do attitude tends to generate, and also maintain the planning and scheduling discipline required to operate as a space truck on a routine and cost-effective basis. As the flight rate increases, the cost and resources and the accompanying impact on future operations must be considered when infrequent but extraordinary efforts are undertaken. The system is still not sufficiently developed as a production line process. In terms of planning or implementing procedures, it cannot routinely or even periodically accept major disruptions without considerable cost. NASA's attitude historically has reflected the position that we can do anything. And while that may essentially be true, NASA's optimism must be tempered by the realization that it cannot do everything. NASA has always taken a positive approach to problem solving and has not evolved to the point where its officials are willing to say they no longer have the resources to respond to proposed changes. Harold Drawn, manager of the Mission Integration Office at Johnson, reinforced this point by describing what would have to happen in 1986 to achieve the flight rate. The next time the guy came in and said, I want to get off this flight and want to move down to, the system would have to say, we can't do that, and that would have been the decision even in the event of a hardware problem. After the problem is fixed, there is still a choice about how to respond. Flight 41-D had a main engine shut down on the launch pad. It had a commercial payload on it, and the NASA Customer Services Division wanted to put that commercial payload on the next flight, replacing some NASA payloads to satisfy more customers. Drawn described the effect of that decision to the commission. We did that. We did not have to, and the system went out and put that in work, but it paid a price. The next three or four flights all slipped as a result. NASA was being too bold in shuffling manifests. The total resources available to the shuttle program for allocation were fixed. As time went on, the agency had to focus those resources more and more on the near-term worrying about today's problem and not focusing on tomorrow's. NASA also did not have a way to forecast the effect of a change of a manifest. As already indicated, a change to one flight ripples through the manifest and typically necessitates changes to many other flights, each requiring resources, budget, manpower, facilities, to implement. Some changes are more expensive than others, but all have an impact, and those impacts must be understood. In fact, Leonard Nicholson, manager of Space Transportation System Integration and Operations at Johnson, in arguing for the development of a forecasting tool, illustrated the fact that the resources were spread thin. The press of business would have hindered us getting that kind of tool in place, just the fact that all of us were busy. The effect of shuffling major payloads can be significant. In addition, as stated earlier, even apparently easy changes put demands on the resources of the system. Any mid-deck or secondary payload has by itself a minimal impact compared with major payloads, but when several changes are made, and made late, they put significant stress on the flight preparation process by diverting resources from higher priority problems. Volume 3 of JSC 07700 Revision B 
specifies that all mid-deck experiments must be scheduled and payload specialists assigned 11 weeks before launch. The rule has not been enforced. In fact, it is more honored in the breach than in the observance. A review of missions 41G through 61C revealed that of the 16 payload specialists added to those flights, seven were added after launch minus five months. Even secondary payloads take a lot of time and attention when they are added to a flight late. Harold Drawn, I spend more than half of my time working on things that are not very important because they get put in so late, rather than working on PAMs, payload assist modules, and IUSs, inertial upper stages, I am working on chicken eggs. Those directing the changes in the manifest were not yet sensitive to the problem. Each change nibbles away at the operational resources, and the changes were occurring frequently, even routinely. Much of the capacity of the system was being used up responding to late changes in lower-priority experiments. That flexibility towards secondary experiments tied up the resources that would have been better spent building capability to meet the projected flight rate. Tommy Holloway, chief of the Johnson Flight Director Office, emphasized that, given finite resources, one must decide its flight rate versus manifest flexibility. The portion of the system forced to respond to the late changes in the manifest Try to bring its concerns to headquarters. As Mr. Nicholson explained, we have not done enough complaining about it, that I cannot believe there is not a growing awareness, but the political aspects of the decision are so overwhelming that our concerns do not carry much weight. The general argument we gave about distracting the attention of the team late in the process of implementing the flight is a qualitative argument, and in the face of that, political advantages of implementing those late changes outweighed our general objections. It is important to determine how many flights can be accommodated and accommodated safely. NASA must establish a realistic level of expectation, then approach it carefully. Mission schedules should be based on a realistic assessment of what NASA can do safely and well, not on what is possible with maximum effort. The ground rules must be established firmly and then enforced. The attitude is important, and the word operational can mislead. Operational should not imply any less commitment to quality or safety, nor a dilution of resources. The attitude should be, we are going to fly high-risk flights this year, Everyone is going to be a challenge, and everyone is going to involve some risk, so we had better be careful in our approach to each. Effect of Flight Rate on Spare Parts As the flight rate increases, the demand on resources and the demand for spare parts increases. Since 1981, NASA has had logistics plans for shuttle flight rates of 12 and 24 flights a year. It was originally forecast, in mid-1983, that the supply of spares required to support 12 flights annually could be accomplished in the spring of 1986. Actual inventory of spare parts had run close to plan until the second quarter of fiscal year 1985. At that time, inventory requirements for spares began to increase faster than deliveries. A year later, when inventory stockage should have been complete, only 32,000 of the required 50,000 items, 65%, had been delivered. The spare parts plan to support 24 flights per year had called for completing inventory stockage by June 1987. By mid-1985, that schedule was in jeopardy. The logistics plan could not be fully implemented because of budget reductions. In October 1985, the logistics funding requirement for the orbiter program, as determined by Level 3 management at Johnson, was $285.3 million. That funding was reduced by $83.3 million, a cut that necessitated major deferrals of spare parts purchases. Purchasing deferrals come at a great cost. For example, a reduction due to deferral of $11.2 million in fiscal year 1986 would cost $11.2 million in fiscal year 1987, 
plus an additional $21.6 million in fiscal year 1988. This three-to-one ratio of future cost to current savings is not uncommon. Indeed, the ratio in many instances is as high as seven-to-one. This practice cannot make sense by any standard of good financial management. According to Johnson officials, reductions in spare expenditures provided savings required to meet the revised budgets. As program manager Arnold Aldrich reported to the commission, there had been fund contentions in the program for a number of years, at least starting in the mid-70s and running through into the early to mid-80s. Intentional decisions were made to defer the heavy buildup of spare parts procurements in the program so that the funds could be devoted to other more pressing activities. It was a regular occurrence for several annual budget cycles. And once the flight rate really began to rise and it was really clear that spare parts were going to be a problem, significant attention was placed on that problem by all levels of NASA and efforts have been made to catch up. But our parts availability is well behind the flight need. Those actions resulted in a critical shortage of serviceable spare components. To provide parts required to support the flight rate, NASA had to resort to cannibalization. Extensive cannibalization of spares, that is, the removal of components from one orbiter for installation in another, became an essential modus operandi in order to maintain flight schedules. Forty-five out of approximately 300 acquired parts were cannibalized for Challenger before Mission 51-L. These parts span the spectrum from common bolts to a thrust control actuator for the orbital maneuvering system to a fuel cell. This practice is costly and disruptive, and it introduces opportunities for component damage. This concern was summarized in testimony before the commission by Paul Weitz, deputy chief of the astronaut office at Johnson. It increases the exposure of both orbiters to intrusion by people. Every time you get people inside and around the orbiter, you stand a chance of inadvertent damage of whatever type, whether you leave a tool behind or whether you, without knowing it, step on a wire bundle or a tube or something along those lines. Cannibalization is a potential threat to flight safety, as parts are removed from one orbiter, installed in another orbiter, and eventually replaced. Each handling introduces another opportunity for imperfections in installation and for damage to the parts in spacecraft. Cannibalization also drains resources, as one Kennedy official explained to the Commission on March 5, 1986. It creates a large expenditure in manpower at KSC, a job that you would have normally used, what we will call one unit of effort to do the job, now requires two units of effort because you've got two ships or orbiters to do the task with. Prior to the Challenger accident, the shortage of spare parts had no serious impact on flight schedules, but cannibalization is possible only so long as orbiters from which to borrow are available. In the spring of 1986, there would have been no orbiters to use as spare parts bins. Columbia was to fly in March, Discovery was sent to Vandenberg, and Atlantis and Challenger were to fly in May. In a commission interview, Kennedy Director of Shuttle Engineering Horace Lamberth predicted the program would have been unable to continue. I think we would have been brought to our knees this spring, 1986, by this problem, spare parts if we had kept trying to fly. NASA's processes for spares provisioning, determining the appropriate spares inventory levels, procurement and inventory control are complicated and could be streamlined and simplified. As of spring 1986, the Space Shuttle Logistics Program was approximately one year behind. Further, the replenishment of all spares, even parts that are not currently available in the system, has been stopped. Unless logistics support is improved, the ability to maintain even a three-orbiter fleet is in jeopardy. Spare parts provisioning is yet another illustration that the shuttle program was not prepared for an operational schedule. The policy was short-sighted and led to cannibalization in order to meet the increasing flight rate. The Importance of Flight Experience In a developmental program, it is important to make use of flight experience 
both to understand the system's actual performance and to uncover problems that might not have been discovered in testing. Because shuttle flights were coming in fairly rapid succession, it was becoming difficult to analyze all the data from one flight before the next was scheduled to launch. In fact, the flight readiness review for 51-L was held while mission 61-C was still in orbit. Obviously, it was impossible to even present, much less analyze and understand, anomalies from that flight. The point can be emphasized by citing two problems that occurred during mission 61-C, but were discovered too late to be considered at the 51-L flight readiness review. 1. The space shuttle brakes and tires have long been a source of concern. In particular, after the 51-D orbiter blew a tire at Kennedy in April 1985, there was considerable effort, within budgetary constraints, to understand and resolve the problems, and Kennedy landings were suspended until certain improvements were made. See Section Landing Another Critical Phase, page 186. Mission 51-L was to be the first flight to land in Florida, since 51-D had experienced brake problems. STS-61-C landed at Edwards Air Force Base in California on January 19, 1986, four days after the 51-L flight readiness review. The 61-C brakes were removed following landing and shipped to the vendor for further inspection and analysis. That inspection revealed major brake damage. The subsystems manager at Johnson, in charge of the brakes, did not receive the information until January 27, 1986, one day before 51-L was launched, and did not learn the extent of the problem until January 30, 1986. 2. The inspection of the 61-C solid rocket booster segments was completed on January 19, 1986, four days after the 51-L Level 1 Flight Readiness Review. The post-recovery inspection of the 61-C solid rocket booster segments revealed that there was O-ring erosion in one of the left booster field joints and additional O-ring anomalies on both booster nozzles. Although the information was available for Marshall's 51-L Level 3 review at launch minus one day, it was clearly not available in time for consideration in the formal launch preparation process. These examples underscore the need to establish a list of mandatory post-flight inspections that must precede any subsequent launch. Effect on Payload Safety The payload safety process exists to ensure that each space shuttle payload is safe to fly and that on a given mission, the total integrated cargo does not create a hazard. NASA policy is to minimize its involvement in the payload design process. The payload developer is responsible for producing a safe design, and the developer must verify compliance with NASA safety requirements. The payload safety panel at Johnson conducts a phase series of safety reviews for each payload. At those reviews, the payload developer presents material to enable the panel to assess the payload's compliance with safety requirements. Problems may be identified late, however, often as a result of late changes in the payload design and late inputs from the payload developer. Obviously, the later a hazard is identified, the more difficult it will be to correct. But the payload safety process has worked well in identifying and resolving safety hazards. Unfortunately, pressures to maintain the flight schedule may influence decisions on payload safety provisions and hazard acceptance. This influence was evident in circumstances surrounding the development of two high-priority scientific payloads and their associated booster, the Centaur. Centaur is a space shuttle-compatible booster that can be used to carry heavy satellites from the orbiter's cargo bay to deep space. It was scheduled to fly on two shuttle missions in May 1986, sending the NASA Galileo spacecraft to Jupiter and the European Space Agency Ulysses spacecraft, first to Jupiter, and then out to the planet's orbital plane over the poles of the Sun. The pressure to meet the schedule was substantial because missing launch in May or early June meant a year's wait before planetary alignment would again be satisfactory. Unfortunately, a number of safety and schedule issues clouded Centaur's use. 
in particular Centaur's highly volatile cryogenic propellants, created several problems. If a return to launch site abort ever becomes necessary, the propellants will definitely have to be dumped overboard. Continuing safety concerns about the means and feasibility of dumping added pressure to the launch preparation schedule as the program struggled to meet the launch dates. Of four required payload safety reviews, Centaur had completed three at the time of the Challenger accident, but unresolved issues remained from the last two. In November 1985, the payload safety panel raised several important safety concerns. The final safety review, though scheduled for late January 1986, appeared to be slipping to February, only three months before the scheduled launches. Several safety waivers had been granted, and several others were pending. Late design changes to accommodate possible system failure would probably have required reconsideration of some of the approved waivers. The military version of the Centaur booster, which was not scheduled to fly for some time, was to be modified to provide added safety. But because of the rush to get the 1986 missions launched, these improvements were not approved for the first two Centaur boosters. After the 51-L accident, NASA allotted more than $75 million to incorporate the operational and safety improvements to these two vehicles. We will never know whether the payload safety program would have allowed the Centaur missions to fly in 1986. Had they flown, however, they would have done so without the level of protection deemed essential after the accident. Outside Pressure to Launch After the accident, Rumors appeared in the press to the effect that persons who made the decision to launch Mission 51-L might have been subjected to outside pressure to launch. Such rumors concerning unnamed persons emanating from anonymous sources about events that may never have happened are difficult to disprove and dispel. Nonetheless, during the Commission's hearings, all persons who played key roles in that decision were questioned. Each one attested, under oath, that there had been no outside intervention or pressure of any kind leading up to the launch. There was a large number of other persons who were involved to a lesser extent in that decision, and they were questioned. All of those persons provided the Commission with sworn statements that they knew of no outside pressure or intervention. The Commission and its staff also questioned a large number of other witnesses during the course of the investigation. No evidence was reported to the Commission which indicated that any attempt was ever made by anyone to apply pressure on those making the decision to launch the Challenger. Although there was total lack of evidence that any outside pressure was ever exerted on those who made the decision to launch 51-L, a few speculative reports persisted. One rumor was that plans had been made to have a live communication hookup with the 51-L crew during the State of the Union message. Commission investigators interviewed all of the persons who would have been involved in a hookup if one had been planned, and all stated unequivocally that there was no such plan. Furthermore, to give the crew time to become oriented, NASA does not schedule a communication for at least 48 hours after the launch, and no such communication was scheduled in the case of Flight 51-L. The flight activity officer who was responsible for developing the crew activity plan testified that three live telecasts were planned for the Challenger, but they related in no way to the State of the Union message. During the teacher activities on Flight Day 4, during the phase partitioning experiment on Flight Day 5, during the crew conference on Flight Day 6, the Commission concluded that the decision to launch the Challenger was made solely by the appropriate NASA officials without any outside intervention or pressure. Findings 1. The capabilities of the system were stretched to the limit to support the flight rate in winter 1985-1986. Projections into the spring and summer of 1986 showed a clear trend. The system as it existed would have been unable to deliver crew training software for scheduled flights by the designated dates. The result would have been an unacceptable compression of the time available for the crews to accomplish their required training. 2. Spare parts are in critically short supply. The shuttle program made a conscious decision to postpone spare parts procurements in favor of budget items of perceived higher priority. 
lack of spare parts would likely have limited flight operations in 1986. 3. Stated manifesting policies are not enforced. Numerous late manifest changes, after the cargo integration review, have been made to both major payloads and minor payloads throughout the shuttle program. Late changes to major payloads or program requirements can require extensive resources, money, manpower, facilities, to implement. If many late changes to minor payloads occur, resources are quickly absorbed. Payload specialists frequently were added to a flight well after announced deadlines. Late changes to a mission adversely affect the training and development of procedures for subsequent missions. 4. The scheduled flight rate did not accurately reflect the capabilities and resources. The flight rate was not reduced to accommodate periods of adjustment in the capacity of the workforce. There was no margin in the system to accommodate unforeseen hardware problems. Resources were primarily directed toward supporting the flights, and thus not enough were available to improve and expand facilities needed to support a higher flight rate. 5. Training simulators may be the limiting factor on the flight rate. The two current simulators cannot train crews for more than 12 to 15 flights per year. 6. When flight rates come in rapid succession, current requirements do not ensure that critical anomalies occurring during one flight are identified and addressed appropriately before the next flight. End of section 18. Section 19 of Report to the President by the Presidential Commission on the Space Shuttle Challenger Accident. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Report to the President by the Presidential Commission on the Space Shuttle Challenger Accident. Chapter 9. Other Safety Considerations. Part 1. In the course of its investigation, the Commission became aware of a number of matters that played no part in the Mission 51L accident, but nonetheless hold a potential for safety problems in the future. Some of these matters, those involving operational concerns, were brought directly to the Commission's attention by the NASA Astronaut Office. They were the subject of a special hearing. Other areas of concern came to light as the Commission pursued various lines of investigation in its attempt to isolate the cause of the accident. These inquiries examined such aspects as the development and operation of each of the elements of the space shuttle, the orbiter, its main engines, and the external tank. The procedures employed in the processing and assembly of 51L and launch damage this chapter examines potential risks in two general areas. The first embraces critical aspects of a shuttle flight, for example, considerations related to a possible premature mission termination during the ascent phase, and the risk factors connected with the demanding approach and landing phase. The other focuses on testing, processing, and assembling the various elements of the shuttle. Ascent, a critical phase. The events of Flight 51L dramatically illustrated the dangers of the first stage of a space shuttle ascent. The accident also focused attention on the issues of orbiter abort capabilities and crew escape. Of particular concern to the Commission are the current abort capabilities, options to improve those capabilities, options for crew escape, and the performance of the range safety system. It is not the Commission's intent to second-guess the space shuttle design or try to depict escape provisions that might have saved the 51L crew. In fact, the events that led to destruction of the Challenger progressed very rapidly and without warning. Under those circumstances, the Commission believes it is highly unlikely that any of the systems discussed below, or any combination of those systems, would have saved the Flight 51L crew. Various unexpected conditions during ascent can require premature termination of a shuttle mission. The method of termination or abort depends upon the nature of the unexpected condition and when it occurs. The space shuttle is lifted to orbit by thrust from its two solid rockets and three main engines. The design criteria for the shuttle specify that 
if a single main engine is lost at any time between liftoff and normal main engine cutoff the shuttle must be able to continue to orbit or to execute an intact abort that is make a survivable landing on a runway that design requirement has been met if a single main engine is lost early in ascent the shuttle can return to make an emergency landing at kennedy a return to launch site abort if the failure occurs later the shuttle can make an emergency landing in africa or europe a transatlantic abort landing if the failure occurs during the last part of the ascent the shuttle can proceed around the earth to a landing in the continental united states abort once around or can continue to a lower than planned orbit abort to orbit indeed if the failure occurs late enough the shuttle will achieve the intended orbital conditions return to launch site abort if the termination is necessary because of loss of a main engine during the first four minutes of the flight the shuttle has the capability to fly back to the launch site it continues downrange to burn excess propellant and at the proper point it turns back towards florida the computers shut down the remaining two engines and separate the orbiter from the external tank which falls into the atlantic ocean the orbiter then glides to a landing on the runway at the shuttle landing facility at kennedy transatlantic abort during ascent there comes a time when the shuttle is too far down range to fly back to kennedy if it suffers an engine failure after that point but has not yet achieved enough energy to continue toward orbit it will have to land on the other side of the atlantic it will continue on a special flight path until it achieves the energy necessary to glide to the landing site at that point the shuttle computers will cut off the two remaining engines and separate the orbiter from the external tank the shuttle will then re-enter the lower atmosphere much like a normal entry the landing however will be at a pre-selected site in africa or europe design the shuttle design specifications do not require that the orbiter be able to manage an intact abort i e make it to a runway if a second main engine should fail if two or all three main engines fail within the first five to six minutes of the flight the space shuttle will land in water this maneuver is called a contingency abort and is not believed to be survivable because of damage incurred at water impact the shuttle design requirement did not specify that the shuttle should be able to survive a solid rocket booster failure the system has no way to identify when a booster is about to fail and no way to get the orbiter or the crew away from a failing solid rocket booster crew survival during ascent rests on the following assumptions one the solid rocket boosters will work from ignition to planned separation two if more than one main engine fails the crew must be able to survive a water landing shuttle abort enhancements between 1973 and 1983, first stage abort provisions were assessed many times by all levels of NASA management. Many methods of saving the orbiter and or crew from emergencies during first stage were considered. Ejection seats, which afforded only limited protection during first stage, were provided for the two-man crews of the orbital flight test program, the first four shuttle flights. Other options for operational flights carrying crews of five or more astronauts were considered, but were not implemented because of limited utility, technical complexity, and excessive cost in dollars, weight, or scheduled delays. Because of these factors, NASA adopted the philosophy that the reliability of first-stage ascent must be assured, and that design and testing must preclude time-critical failures that would require emergency action before normal solid rocket booster burnout that philosophy has been reviewed many times during the space shuttle program and is appropriately being reevaluated as are all first stage abort options in light of the fifty one l accident early orbital separation if a problem arose that required the orbiter to get away from failing solid rocket boosters the separation would have to be performed extremely quickly time would be of the essence for two reasons first as fifty one l demonstrated if a problem develops in a solid rocket booster it can escalate very rapidly 
second the ascent trajectory is carefully designed to control the aerodynamic loads on the vehicle very small deviation from the normal path will produce excessive loads so if the vehicle begins to diverge from its path there is very little time seconds before structural breakup will occur the normal separation sequence to free the shuttle from the rest of the system takes eighteen seconds far too long to be of use during a first stage contingency vast separation was formally established by review item discrepancy o three dot o o dot one five one which stated the requirement to separate the orbiter from the external tank at any time the sequence was referred to as fast separation because delays required during normal separation were bypassed or drastically shortened in order to achieve separation in approximately three seconds some risk was accepted to obtain this contingency capability fast separation was incorporated into the flight software so that technically this capability does exist unfortunately analysis has shown that if it is attempted while the solid rocket boosters are still thrusting the orbiter will hang up on its aft attach points and pitch violently with probable loss of the orbiter and crew in summary as long as the solid rocket boosters are still thrusting fast separation does not provide a way to escape it would be useful during the first stage only if solid rocket booster thrust could first be terminated the current concept of fast separation does however have some use contingency aborts resulting from loss of two or three main engines early in ascent are time critical and every fraction of a second that can be trimmed from the separation sequence helps these abort procedures are executed after the solid rocket boosters are expended and fast separation is used to reduce the time required for separation as the shuttle must attain entry altitude very quickly unfortunately all contingency aborts culminate in water impact thrust termination thrust termination or thrust neutralization as originally proposed for the space shuttle was a concept conceived for the titan 3m booster intended for use in the manned orbiting laboratory program the objective of thrust termination is to either extinguish or reduce the thrust of the solid rocket booster in an emergency situation with this thrust terminated emergency options such as crew ejection or fast separation might become feasible during the first two minutes of flight the principal drawback is that thrust termination itself introduces high dynamic loads that could cause shuttle structural components to fail early design reviews suggested that to strengthen the orbiter to withstand the stresses caused by rapid thrust termination would require an additional prohibitive nineteen thousand six hundred pounds thrust termination was deleted from design consideration on april twenty seventh nineteen seventy three by space shuttle directive s s zero 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 four zero key factors in the decision were that one proper design would be stressed to prevent solid rocket booster failure and two other first stage ascent systems provided enough redundancy to allow delaying an abort until after the solid rocket boosters burned out the subject arose again in 1979 when space shuttle directive s13141 required the system contractor to determine the time over which thrust reduction must be spread so that the deceleration loads would not destroy the orbiter marshall analyzed the thrust decay curves submitted by the contractor and concluded that achieving the required thrust decay rates was impractical on july twelfth nineteen eighty two the associate administrator for space transportation systems requested reconsideration of thrust termination gerald griffin director of johnson responded to the request in a letter dated september ninth nineteen eighty two as follows in our opinion further study of a thrust termination system for the srb solid rocket booster would not be productive the potential failure modes which could result in a set of conditions requiring srb thrust termination are either very remote or a result of primary structural failure the structural failure risk would normally be accepted as a part of the factor of safety verification 
by analysis or test in addition any thrust termination system is going to be extremely heavy very costly and at best present some risk to the orbiter and e t external tank venting of trot gases in the shock load or pressure spike have the potential for being as great a hazard as the problem to be corrected it does not appear that a practical approach exists for achieving the desired pressure decay rate without a major redesign of the motor in retrospect the possibility of solid rocket booster failures was neither very remote nor limited to primary structural failure although it would not have helped on mission fifty one l thrust termination is the key to any successful first stage abort and new ideas and technology should be examined if a thrust termination system is eventually deemed feasible that is the orbiter external tank will still be intact after the rapid deceleration it cannot have failure modes that would cause an uncommanded neutralization of the thrust of one or both of the solid rocket boosters if thrust termination were to be implemented reliable detection mechanisms and reliable decision criteria would be mandatory ditching as previously discussed most contingency aborts those resulting from failure of two or three main engines during the first five to six minutes of flight result in a water landing or ditching in addition if the space shuttle did have a thrust termination capability to use with fast separation to allow it to separate from failing solid rockets the orbiter would have to ditch in the water unless the failure occurred during a small window fifty to seventy seconds after launch accordingly whether the crew can survive a water impact is a critical question in 1974 and 1975 ditching studies were conducted at langley research center although test limitations precluded definitive conclusions the studies suggested that the loads at water impact would be high the deceleration would most probably cause structural failure of the crew cabin support ties to the fuselage which would impede crew egress and possibly flood the cabin furthermore payloads in the cargo bay are not designed to withstand decelerations as high as those expected and would very possibly break free and travel forward to the crew cabin the langley report does state that the orbiter shape and mass properties are good for ditching but given the structural problems and deceleration loads that is little consolation orbiter ditching was discussed by the crew safety panel and at orbiter flight techniques meetings before the first shuttle flight the consensus of these groups was that one ditching is more hazardous than suggested by the early langley test and two ditching is probably not survivable this view was reiterated in the september ninth nineteen eighty two letter from griffin to abrahamson we also suggest no further effort be expended to study bailout or ditching there is considerable doubt that either case is technically feasible with the present orbiter design even if a technical solution can be found the impact of providing either capability is so severe in terms of cost and schedule as to make them impractical there is no evidence that a shuttle crew would survive a water impact since all contingency aborts and all first stage abort capabilities that are being studied culminate in a water impact an additional provision for crew escape before impact should also be considered astronaut paul white's expressed this before the commission on april third nineteen eighty six my feeling is so strong that the orbiter will not survive a ditching and that includes land water or any unprepared surface i think if we put the crew in a position where they're going to be asked to do a contingency abort then they need some means to get out of the vehicle before it contacts earth the surface of the earth crew escape options in a study conducted before the orbiter contract was awarded rockwell international evaluated a range of ejection systems rockwell international incorporated phase b study 1971 the table shows the results comparing three systems ejection seats encapsulated ejection seats and a separable crew compartment the development costs are in 1971 dollars and the costs and weights cited were those required to incorporate these systems into the developing orbiter design not to modify an existing orbiter 
the only system that could provide protection for more than the two-man experimental flight crew was the separable crew compartment which would add substantial weight and development cost all these systems had limitations in their ability to provide successful escape and all would require advance warning of an impending hazard from reliable data sources the request for proposal written in april nineteen seventy one reference paragraph one point three point six point two point one states provision shall be made for rapid emergency egress of the crew during development test flights ejection seats were selected as the emergency escape system the objective was to offer the crew some protection though limited from risks of the test flights the philosophy was that after the test flights all unknowns would be resolved and the vehicle would be certified for operational flights conventional ejection seats similar to those installed in the lockheed f-12 sr-71 were selected shortly after the orbiter contract was awarded they were subsequently incorporated into columbia and were available for the first four flights the ejection could be initiated by either crew member and would be used in the event of uncontrolled flight onboard fire or pending landings on unprepared surfaces the escape sequence required approximately fifteen seconds for the crew to recognize pending disaster initiate the sequence and get a safe distance away from the vehicle although the seats were originally intended for use during first stage ascent or during gliding flight below one hundred thousand feet analysis showed that the crew would be exposed to the solid rocket booster and main engine exhaust plumes if they ejected during ascent during descent the seats provided good protection from about one hundred thousand feet to landing after the space shuttle completed the four test flights it was certified for operational flights but missions for the operational flights required more crew members and there were no known ejection systems other than an entire crew escape module that could remove the entire crew within the necessary time the orbiter configuration allowed room for only two ejection seats on the flight deck with alternative ejection concepts and redesign of the flight deck this number might have been increased slightly but not to the full crew size thus because of limited utility during first stage ascent and inability to accommodate a full crew the ejection seats were eliminated for operational flights the present shuttle has no means for crew escape either during first stage ascent or during gliding flight conventional ejection seats do not appear to be viable space shuttle options because they severely limit the crew size and therefore prevent the space shuttle from accomplishing its mission objectives the remaining options fall into three categories one escape module the entire crew compartment would be separated from the orbiter and descend by parachute two rocket assisted extraction many military aircraft employ a system using a variety of small rocket assisted devices to boost occupants from the plane such a system could be used in the orbiter three bailout system the crew can exit unassisted through a hatch during controlled gliding flight only one of these the escape module offers the possibility of escape during first stage ascent its use would probably be practical only after thrust termination it should be noted that in all cases of crew escape the orbiter would be lost but in cases of solid rocket booster failure or or orbiter ditching the vehicle would be lost anyway the utility and feasibility of each method are described below an escape module can offer an opportunity for crew escape at all altitudes during a first stage time critical emergency if the escape system itself is not damaged to the point that it cannot function the module must be sufficiently far from the vehicle at the time of catastrophe that neither it nor its descent system is destroyed incorporation of an escape module would require significant redesign of the orbiter some structural reinforcement pyrotechnic devices to sever the escape module from the rest of the orbiter modifications to sever connections that supply power and fluids separation rockets and a parachute system an additional weight penalty would result from the requirement to add mass in the rear of the orbiter to compensate for the forward shift in the center of gravity 
Recent estimates indicate that this could add as much as 30,000 pounds to the weight of the orbiter. This increase in weight would reduce payload capacity considerably, perhaps unacceptably. There is no current estimate of the attendant cost. An escape module does theoretically offer the widest range of crew escape options. The other two options, rocket extraction and bailout, are only practical during gliding flight. Both methods would be useful when the orbiter could not reach a prepared runway, for they would allow the crew to escape before a very hazardous landing or a water ditching. Aerodynamic model tests show that a crew member bailing out through either the side or overhead hatch would subsequently contact the wing, tail, or orbital maneuvering system pod unless he or she could exit with sufficient velocity, over 5 to 10 feet per second to avoid these obstacles. Slides and pendant rocket systems were evaluated as means of providing this velocity, but all concepts of bailout and rocket extraction that were studied require many minutes to get the entire crew out and would be practical only during controlled gliding flight. The results of these studies were presented at the Program Requirements Change Board session held on May 12, 1983 and subsequently to the NASA Administrator, but none of the alternatives was implemented because of limited capability and resulting program impacts. There is much discussion and disagreement over which escape systems are feasible, or whether any provide protection against a significant number of failure modes. The astronauts testifying before the Commission on April 3, 1986, agree that it does not appear practical to modify the orbiter to incorporate an escape module. The astronauts disagreed, however, about which of the other two systems would be preferable. As astronaut Whites testified, John, astronaut John Young, likes the rocket extraction system because it does cover a wider flight regime and allows you to get out, perhaps with a vehicle only under partial control, as opposed to complete control. However, any system that adds more parts, like rockets, gets more complex. The only kind of a system that I think is even somehow feasible would be maybe some kind of a bailout system that could be used subsonic. In its 1982 annual report, the Aerospace Safety Advisory Panel listed crew escape at launch and prior to potential ditching as a priority item that warranted further study. The Commission fully supports such studies. In particular, the Commission believes that the crew should have a means of escaping the orbiter in controlled gliding flight. The Commission thinks it crucial that the vehicle that will carry astronauts into orbit through the decade and the next incorporate systems that provide some chance for crew survival in emergencies. It nonetheless accepts the following point made by astronaut Robert Crippen. I don't know of an escape system that would have saved the crew from the particular incident that we just went through, the Challenger accident. End of section 19. Section 20 of Report to the President by the Presidential Commission on the Space Shuttle Challenger Accident. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Michael, Sussex, Wisconsin, USA, January 2021. Range Safety Television coverage of the Challenger accident vividly showed the solid rocket boosters emerging from the ball of fire and smoke. The erratic and uncontrolled powered flight of such large components could have posed a potential danger to populated areas. The responsible official accordingly destroyed the solid rocket boosters. To understand how the booster rockets were destroyed, one must understand the purpose of a range safety system, its functions, and the special considerations that apply to shuttle launches. The Eastern Space and Missile Center operates a range safety system for all Department of Defense and NASA launch activities in the Cape Canaveral area. The primary responsibility of the range safety system, run by the U.S. Air Force, is to protect people and property from abnormal vehicle flights during first stage ascent. 
to fulfill its range safety responsibilities, the Eastern Space and Missile Center staff supervises on-site launch preparations and tracks rockets and vehicles until they are far enough away from populated areas to remove any danger. When such a danger arises during the ascent stage of a launch, the vehicle may have to be destroyed to minimize harm to persons and property on the ground. Every major vehicle flown from the Cape Canaveral area has carried an explosive destruct system that could be armed and fired by the range safety officer. Range safety procedures and launch activities from Kennedy are governed by the Department of Defense and NASA documents. The primary regulatory publication is DOD document 3200.11, Use, Management, and Operation of DOD Major Ranges and Test Facilities. Space Shuttle Range Safety System. Both Space Shuttle solid rocket boosters and the external tank are fitted with explosive charges. These can be detonated on the command of the range safety officer if the vehicle crosses the limits established by flight analysis before launch and the vehicle is no longer in controlled flight. The determination of controllability is made by the flight director in Mission Control, Houston, who is in communication with the range safety officer. Following an encoded arm command, the existing package on the shuttle system is detonated by a subsequent encoded quote-unquote fire command. The range safety officer who sends the commands is the key decision maker who is finally responsible for preventing loss of life and property that could result if the vehicle or components should fall in populated areas. The destruct criteria are agreed to by NASA and the Eastern Space and Missile Center. A range safety system for the shuttle launches was approved in concept in 1974. Under that concept, the capability to destroy the system in flight from the ground was to be installed in the form of radio-detonated explosive charges triggered by encoded signals. Such a range safety package appeared necessary for a variety of reasons based upon the initial shuttle design that included ejection seats. If the crew were to eject, the unmanned vehicle would be uncontrollable and thus a much greater danger than a manned system. After the first four test flights, however, the ejection seats were deactivated. Retaining the range safety package when the crew could no longer escape was an emotional and controversial decision. In retrospect, however, the Challenger accident has demonstrated the need for some type of range safety measure. Since the current range safety system does not allow for selective destruction of components, the Commission believes that NASA and the Air Force should critically re-examine whether the destruct package on the external tank might be removed. Range Safety Activities, January 28, 1986. The range safety officer for the Challenger flight on January 28th was Major Gerald F. Beringer, U.S. Air Force. He reported that the mission was normal until about 76 seconds after launch. The following description is from Major Beringer's written statement prepared approximately two hours after the accident. Quote, Watching the IP, or impact point, displays and optics, I observed the primary and alternative sources diverge significantly at about T plus 76, or 76 seconds into the flight. At about the same time I heard, through monitored communications, the vehicle had exploded. Concurrently, I saw the explosion on the video monitor on my right. A white cloud seemed to envelop the vehicle. Small pieces exploded out of it. The IP displays, PRI and ALT indications, were jumping around wildly as I was about to recommend we do nothing as it appeared the entire vehicle had exploded when I observed what appeared to be an SRB, solid rocket booster stabilized and flying toward the upper left corner of the display. As it appeared stabilized, I felt it might endanger land or shipping, and as the ET, or external tank, had apparently exploded, I recommended to the SRSO, the Senior Range Safety Officer, we send functions. I sent ARM, 
waited about 10 seconds, and sent fire. Fire was sent at about 110 seconds. End quote. During the flight and prior to the accident, tracking and control functions performed normally. There were no communication problems throughout the range or with the NASA Flight Dynamics Officer in Mission Control Houston. Range safety data displays did not provide useful information immediately after the accident. The range safety officer depended upon the video displays for evidence concerning the performance of the solid rocket boosters. Without that information, the range safety officer would not have sent the destruct signals. Detailed studies from Marshall had indicated that the solid rocket boosters would tumble if prematurely separated. That assumption made possible the prediction of impact points. When the Challenger solid rocket boosters separated after the explosion, however, they continued powered, stabilized flight, and did not tumble, contrary to the expectations upon which range safety rules had been based. Without the live television pictures, the range safety officer would not have known about the unexpected performance of the boosters. The Eastern Space and Missile Center and NASA have appropriately initiated a comprehensive review of the shuttle range safety requirements and their implementation. The events of the Challenger accident demonstrate the need for a range safety package of some type on the solid rocket boosters. However, the review should examine whether technology exists that would allow combining the range safety function for the solid rocket boosters with a thrust termination system and whether, if technically feasible, it would be desirable. Post-Flight Analysis The Mission Control Center in Houston had no more warning of the impending disaster than the range safety officer had. All information that might be useful in recognizing problems that the crew or the Mission Control flight team could do something about is available to flight controllers during the launch, but that information constitutes only a fraction of the electronic data being telemetered from the shuttle. To ensure that nothing was overlooked during the launch, Johnson Flight Controllers conducted a thorough analysis of the telemetry data on January 29 and 30, 1986. Their review of the recorded events revealed that the chamber pressure inside the solid rocket booster began to differ from that of the left booster approximately 60 seconds after liftoff. A sampling of that information is available to a flight controller during ascent, but the internal pressures of the boosters are normally not monitored during the first stage. The readings are used only to indicate whether the crew can expect an on-time or slightly delayed separation of the boosters from the orbital and the external tank. The difference in pressure during the brief ascent of Challenger was small, and pressures were within acceptable limits. The replay of the data also indicated that the flight control system was responding properly to external forces and continued to control the shuttle until the accident. No unusual motion responses occurred, and inside the cockpit there were no alarms. There are no indications that the crew had any warning of a problem before the fire and the disintegration of the space shuttle. Findings 1. The space shuttle system was not designed to survive a failure of the solid rocket boosters. There are no corrective actions that can be taken if the boosters do not operate properly after ignition, i.e., there is no ability to separate an orbiter safely from thrusting boosters and no ability for the crew to escape the vehicle during first stage ascent. Neither the mission control team nor the 51L crew had any warning of impending disaster. Even if there had been warning, there were no actions available to the crew or the mission control team to avert disaster. Landing, another critical phase. The consequences of faulty performance in any dynamic and demanding flight environment can be catastrophic. The Commission was concerned that an insufficient safety margin may have existed in areas other than shuttle ascent. Entry and landing of the shuttle are dynamic and demanding, with all the risks and complications inherent in flying a heavyweight glider with a very steep glide path. Since the shuttle crew cannot divert to any alternative landing site after entry, the landing decision must be both timely and accurate. 
In addition, the landing gear, which includes wheels, tires, and brakes, must function properly. These considerations will be discussed for both normal and abort landings. Abort Site Weather the acceptability of weather at abort landing sites, both inside and outside the continental United States, is a critical factor in the launch decision process. The local weather minima for the actual launch are necessarily restrictive. The minima for acceptably safe abort landings are even more restrictive. Of course, the wider the range of acceptable weather conditions, the greater the possibility of launch on any given day. As a result of past efforts to increase the likelihood of launch, abort landing weather criteria are currently less restrictive than the criteria for planned landings. The program also allows consideration of launching with a light rain shower over the Kennedy runway. Although engineering assessments indicate that the tile damage that would result would not affect shuttle controllability, it would be a serious setback to the program in terms of budget and schedule. This rule is designed to allow the program to weigh the probability of a return to launch site abort and decide whether it is worthwhile to launch and accept the risk of a setback because of tile damage should a return to launch site abort be required. This risk appears to be unnecessary. The programmatic decision to accept worse weather for an abort landing, in a situation where other conditions are also less than optimal, is not consistent with a conservative approach to flight safety. The desire to launch is understandable and abort landings are indeed improbable. However, if an abort is required, it is irrelevant that it was unlikely. An emergency, the loss of a space shuttle main engine, has already occurred to produce the necessity. Abort situations will require landing under emergency conditions on limited runways with orbiter weights higher than normal. The difficulty should not be compounded by high crosswinds or reduced visibility. The Commission recommended that this subject be reviewed, and those reviews are currently underway. Orbiter Tires and Brakes the Aerospace Safety Advisory Panel has shared NASA's concern over the orbiter wheels, tires, and brakes since the beginning of the shuttle program. This is summarized in its 1982 annual report. Quote, the landing gear, including wheels, tires, and brakes, is vital for safe completion of any mission. With the future flights going to higher weights and lower margins, possibly even negative margins, it is imperative that existing capabilities be fully explored, documented, and improved where necessary. End quote. Orbiter tires. Orbiter tires are manufactured by B.F. Goodrich and are designed to support a space shuttle landing up to 240,000 pounds at 225 knots with 20 knots of crosswind. The tires have a 34-ply rating using 16 cords. Though they have successfully passed testing programs, they have shown excessive wear during the landings at Kennedy, especially when crosswinds were involved. The tires are rated as criticality 1 because loss of a single tire could cause loss of control and subsequent loss of vehicle and crew. Based upon approach and landing test experience, crosswind testings was added to the Space Shuttle Tire Certification Testing. To date, Orbiters have landed with a maximum of eight knots of crosswind at the Kennedy runway, resulting in heavy tire wear, both spin-up wear that occurs initially at touchdown and crosswind wear induced by side forces and differential braking. While dynamometer tests indicated that these tires should withstand conditions well above the design specification, the tests have not been able to simulate runway surface effects accurately. A Langley Research Center test track has been used to give a partial simulation of the strains caused by a landing at Kennedy. This test apparatus will be upgraded for further testing in the summer of 1986 in an attempt to include all the representative flight loads and conditions. The tires have undergone extensive testing to examine effects of vacuum exposure, temperature extremes, and cuts. They also have undergone leakage, side force, load, storage, and durability tests. The tires have qualified in all these areas.
To date, tests using the simulated Kennedy runway at Langley indicate that spin-up wear by itself will not lead to tire failure. Tests using the Kennedy test surface do indicate that spin-up wear is worse if the tire is subjected to crosswind. For this reason, the crosswind allowable for normal landings is limited to 10 knots. This restriction also permits a safe stop if the nose wheel steering system fails. The limitation is being reviewed to see if it is too high for abort landings involving nose wheel steering failure. Testing has not been conducted to ensure that excessive crosswind wear will not be a hazard when landing on the various hard surface runways with maximum crosswinds and failed nose wheel steering. Main tire loads are increased substantially after nose wheel touchdown because of the large downward wing force at its negative angle of attack. The total force on each side can be nearly 200,000 pounds, which exceeds the capability of a single tire. In fact, the touchdown loads alone can exceed the load bearing ability of a single tire. The obvious result is that if a single tire fails before nose gear touchdown, the vehicle will have a serious, if not catastrophic, directional control problem following the expected failure of the adjacent tire. This failure case has led a criticality 1 rating on the tires. Before nose gear touchdown, control is maintained through a rudder. However, it loses effectiveness as the speed brake is opened and the vehicle decelerates. After nose gear touchdown, simulations have shown that directional control is possible using the nose wheel steering system for most subsequent failures, but not for some cases in which crosswinds exceed the current flight rule limits. Because of the consequences of this failure, crew members strongly recommend that the nose wheel steering system be modified to achieve full redundancy. Tire side loads have been difficult to measure and subsequently model because of test facility limitations. Two mathematical models were developed from early dynameter tests and extrapolation from nose wheel tire tests. New dynamic tests of main gear tires show a more flexible side response, which has been incorporated into the latest mathematical model. A reasonably accurate model is required both for nose wheel steering engineering studies and for crew training simulators. The Orbiter tire in use meets specifications and has been certified through testing. However, testing has not reproduced results observed on Kennedy runways. To date, the only blown tire has been caused by a brake lockup and resulting skid wear. Several improvements have been considered to increase protection against the high speed blown tire case. One would add a skirt at the bottom of the main gear strut to take the peak load during nose gear touchdown. Another would add a roll on rim capability to the main gear wheel. None of the possible improvements has been funded, however, nor has any been seriously studied. In summary, two blown tires before nose gear touchdown would likely be catastrophic, and the potential for that occurrence should be minimized. NASA has directed testing in the fall of 1986 to examine actual tire, wheel, and strut failures to better understand this failure case. Orbiter Brakes The orbiter brake design chosen in 1973 was based on the orbiter's design weight. It used beryllium rotors and stators with carbon lining. However, as the actual orbiter weight grew, the response from the shuttle program management was not a redesign of the brakes, but an extension of required runway length from 10,000 to 12,500 feet. Thus, the brakes for many years have been known to have little or no margin, even if they performed as originally designed. There are four brake assemblies, one for each main landing gear wheel. Each assembly uses four rotors, and three statters, the statters being attached to a torque tube. Carbon pads are attached to provide the friction surface. The orbiter brakes were designed to absorb 36.5 million foot-pounds of energy for normal stops and 55.5 million foot-pounds of energy for one emergency stop. The brakes were tested and qualified using standard dynamometer tests. Actual flight experience has shown brake damage on most flights. The damage is classified by cause as either dynamic or thermal. 
The dynamic damage is usually characterized by damage to rotors and carbon lining chipping, plus beryllium and pad retainer cracks. On the other hand, the thermal damage has been due to heating of the stator caused by energy absorption during breaking. The beryllium becomes ductile and has a much reduced yield strength at temperatures possible during breaking. Both types of damage are typical of early brake development problems experienced in the aviation industry. Brake damage has required that special crew procedures be developed to assure successful braking. To minimize dynamic damage and to keep any loose parts together, the crews were told to hold the brakes on constantly from the time of the first application until their speed slows to about 40 knots. For a normal landing, braking is initiated at about 130 knots. For abort landings, braking would be initiated at about 150 knots. Braking speeds are established to avoid exceeding the temperature limits of the stator. The earlier the brakes are applied, the higher the heat rate. The longer the brakes are applied, the higher the temperature will be, no matter what the heat rate. To minimize problems, the commander must get the brake energy into the brakes at just the right rate and just the right time before the beryllium yields and causes a low speed wheel lockup. At a commission hearing on April 3, 1986, Astronaut John Young described the problem the shuttle commander has with the system. Quote, it is very difficult to use precisely right now. In fact, we're finding out we don't really have a good technique for applying the brakes. We don't believe that astronauts or pilots should be able to break the brakes. End quote. Missions 5, 51D, and 61C had forms of thermal stator damage. The Mission 51D case resulted in a low-speed wheel lockup and a subsequent blown tire at Kennedy. The Mission 61C case did not progress to a lockup, but came very close. The amount of brake energy that can be obtained from normal braking procedures is about 40 million foot-pounds before the first stator falls off. The Mission 61C damage occurred at 34 million foot-pounds, but had not progressed to the lockup condition. Inspection of failed stators clearly shows the ductile failure response of the beryllium, and hence, it appears that this failure mechanism cannot contribute to a high-speed lockup and subsequent tire failure. It should be noted that the brake specification called for a maximum energy of 55 million foot-pounds. Qualification testing of the abort braking profile showed that 55 million foot-pounds was the point of first stator failure. During qualification tests, the brakes continued to operate until all stators failed, providing about another 5 million foot-pounds of energy. Based upon the thermal response of the beryllium under load, it appears that the early heavy braking required for transatlantic abort landings produces more than 40 million foot-pounds that have resulted in a thermal failure of the brakes during the normal braking profile. No numbers are certain, however, and clearly the qualification testing did not point out the current thermal problems. The assumed normal and abort brake energy limits for the current design should be reinvestigated. The 61C damage resulted from only 34 million foot-pounds of energy, and destructive testing should be accomplished to establish the short runway, transatlantic abort landing, brake limit, and appropriate abort landing planning factors. NASA is considering stator improvements, including steel or thicker beryllium stators, and has undertaken a carbon brake program that would provide a major margin improvement and less dynamic damage because of fewer parts. Additional testing is currently underway and more is planned to evaluate these brake modifications and to perform destructive testing. The testing results are expected to conform more closely to flight conditions because landing gear dynamics have been included. Early tests have confirmed the energy levels for the abort braking profile with a modified brake, and future tests may provide confidence in the normal braking profile. The Aerospace Safety Advisory Panel recognized NASA's efforts in its 1985 annual report. Quote, a carbon brake review was conducted by NASA in early 1985 and resulted in agreement to procure a carbon brake system for the orbiter. 
There is concern by the Space Transformation System Management about the availability of resources to support the development of the carbon brakes, given the many competing requirements and the projected constrained budget during the 1986 period. The program management considers the development of the carbon brake system to be of the highest priority, and the panel supports this position as it has in the past." End quote. Because of the brake problems encountered in the program, two reviews have been conducted by NASA. The third review will take place during the summer of 1986. The review board members have studied all of the orbiter brake data and have compared orbiter problems to industry problems. Improvements suggested have been implemented. It is the consensus of NASA and industry experts that high priority should be placed on correcting orbiter brake problems and that brake redesign should proceed with emphasis on developing higher energy and torque capacity. Concern within the program about the entire deceleration system, landing gear, wheels, tires, brakes, and nose wheel steering, has been the subject of numerous reviews, meetings, and design efforts. These concerns continued to be expressed by the Aerospace Safety Advisory Panel in 1982. Quote, Studies of shuttle landings to date show that tire, wheel, and brake stresses are approaching limits. Short runways with inadequate overruns are cause for concern. For instance, a transatlantic abort to Dakar, end quote. These issues are difficult, and the required technology is challenging, but most agree that it is appropriate and important that NASA resolve each of these problems. A conservative approach to the landing phase of flight demands reliable performance by all critical systems. End of Section 20. Recording by John Michael, Sussex, Wisconsin, USA, January 2021. Section 21 of Report to the President by the Presidential Commission on the Space Shuttle Challenger Accident. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Michael, Sussex, Wisconsin, USA, January 2021. Report to the President by the Presidential Commission on the Space Shuttle Challenger Accident Section 21. Kennedy Space Center Landings. The original space shuttle plan called for routine landings at Kennedy to minimize turnaround time and cost per flight, and to provide an efficient operation for both the shuttle system and the cargo elements. While those considerations remain important, other concerns such as the performance of the orbiter tires and brakes and the difficulty of accurate weather prediction in Florida have called the plan into question. When the shuttle lands at Edwards Air Force Base, California, approximately six days are added to the turnaround time compared with a landing at Kennedy. That is the time required to load the orbiter atop the shuttle carrier aircraft, a specially modified Boeing 747, and to ferry it back to Florida for processing. Returning the orbiter to Kennedy from Edwards costs not only time but also money, nearly $1 million, not including the cost of additional ground support, equipment, extra security, and other support requirements. Further, the people necessary to accomplish the turnaround tasks must be drawn from the staffs at Kennedy and Vandenberg Air Force Base, California. They are the same people needed for the preparation for subsequent flights. Returning the orbiter also imposes an additional handling risk to the vehicle in both the loading operation and the ferry flight itself. Encountering light precipitation during the ferry flight has caused substantial damage to the orbiter thermal protection system. These costs and risks, however, are minimal when compared to those of a space shuttle mission. The Kennedy runway was built to space shuttle design requirements that exceeded all Federal Aviation Administration requirements and was coordinated extensively with the Air Force Dryden Flight Research Center, NASA Headquarters, Johnson, Kennedy, Marshall, and the Army Corps of Engineers. The result is a single concrete runway, 15,000 feet long and 300 feet wide. The grooved and coarse brushed surface 
and the high coefficient of friction provide an all-weather landing facility. The Kennedy runway easily meets the intent of most of the Air Force, Federal Aviation Administration, and International Civil Aviation Organization specification requirements. According to NASA, it was the best runway that the world knew how to build when the final design was determined in 1973. In the past several years, questions about weather predictability and shuttle systems performance have influenced the Kennedy landing issue. Experience gained in the 24 shuttle landings has raised concerns about the adequacy of the shuttle landing and rollout systems, tires, brakes, and nose wheel steering. Tires and brakes have been discussed earlier. The tires have shown excessive wear after Kennedy landings, where the rough runway is particularly hard on tires. Tire wear became a serious concern after the landing of Mission 51D at Kennedy. Spin-up wear was three cords deep, Crosswind wear, in only an 8-knot crosswind, was significant, and one tire eventually failed as a result of brake lockup and skid. This excessive wear, coupled with brake failure, led NASA to schedule subsequent landings at Edwards while attempting to solve these problems. At the commission hearing on April 3, 1986, Clifford Charlesworth, Director of Space Operations at Johnson, stated his reaction to the blown tire incident. Quote, Let me say that following 51D, one of the first things I did was go talk to the then program manager, Mr. Looney, and say we don't want to try that again until we understand that, which he completely agreed with, and we launched into this nose wheel steering development. Unquote. There followed minor improvements to the braking system. The nose wheel steering system was also improved so that it, rather than differential braking, could be used for directional control to reduce tire wear. These improvements were made before Mission 61C, and it was deemed safe for that mission and subsequent missions to land at Kennedy. Bad weather in Florida required that 61C land at Edwards. There were again problems with the brakes, indicating that the shuttle braking system was still suspect. Mr. Charlesworth provided this assessment to the Commission. Quote, Given the problem that has come up now with the brakes, I think that whole question still needs some more work before I would be satisfied that, yes, we should go back and try to land at the Cape. End quote. The nose wheel steering, regarded as fail-safe, might better be described as fail-passive. At worst, a single failure will cause the nose wheel to castor. Thus, a single failure in nose wheel steering, coupled with failure conditions that require its use, could result in departure from the runway. There is a long-range program to improve the nose wheel steering so that a single failure will leave the system operational. Eight flights have been launched with plans to land in Florida. Of those, three have been diverted to California because of bad weather. Moreover, it is indicative of the dynamic weather environment in Florida that twice in the program's history, flights have been waved off for one orbit to allow for weather conditions to improve enough to be acceptable for landing. Thus, even if NASA eventually were to resume routine operations at Kennedy, experience indicates the orbital will divert into Edwards more than 30% of the time. NASA must therefore plan to use Edwards routinely. This requires reserving six days in the post-landing processing schedule for the orbiter's ferry trip back to Florida. It also requires redundancy in the ferry aircraft. The single shuttle carrier aircraft, with some one-of-a-kind support items, is presently the only way to get the orbiter from California back to its launch site in Florida. Table of Landing Site Changes Mission STS-3 Wave-offs, 1. Reason, flooding. Scheduled landing, Edwards, actual landing, Northrop Strip, New Mexico. Mission STS-7. Wave-offs, 2. Reason, rain, slash, ceiling. Scheduled landing, Kennedy, actual landing, Edwards. Mission STS-41C. Wave-offs, 1. Reason, rain, slash, ceiling. Scheduled landing Kennedy, actual landing Edwards. Mission 
STS-61C, Wave Offs 5, Reason, Rain Slash Ceiling, Schedule Landing, Kennedy, Actual Landing, Edwards. The most serious concern is not that the weather in Florida is bad, but that the atmospheric conditions are frequently unpredictable. Captain Robert Crippen testified before the commission on April 3, 1986. Quote, I don't think the astronaut office would disagree with the premise that you are much safer landing at Edwards. There are some things you could do, as was indicated, to make Kennedy better, but you're never going to overcome the weather unpredictability. End quote. Once the shuttle performs the deorbit burn, it is going to land approximately 60 minutes later. There is no way to return to orbit, and there is no option to select another landing site. This means that the weather forecaster must analyze the landing site weather nearly one and one half hours in advance of landing, and that the forecast must be accurate. Unfortunately, the Florida weather is particularly difficult to forecast at certain times of the year. In the spring and summer, thunderstorms build and dissipate quickly and unpredictably. Early morning fog also is very difficult to predict if the forecast must be made in the hour before sunrise. In contrast, the stable weather patterns at Edwards make the forecaster's job much easier. Although NASA has a conservative philosophy and applies conservative flight rules in evaluating end-of-mission weather, the decision always comes down to evaluating a weather forecast. There is a risk associated with that. If the program requirements put forecasters in the position of predicting weather when weather is unpredictable, it is only a matter of time before the crew is allowed to leave orbit and arrive in Florida to find thunderstorms or rapidly forming ground fog. Either could be disastrous. The weather at Edwards, of course, is not always acceptable for landing either. In fact, only days prior to the launch of STS-3, NASA was forced to shift the normal landing site from Edwards to Northrop Strip, New Mexico, because of flooding of the Edwards lake bed. This points out the need to support fully both Kennedy and Edwards as potential end-of-mission landing sites. In summary, although there are valid programmatic reasons to land routinely at Kennedy, there are concerns that suggest that this is not wise under the present circumstances. While planned landings at Edwards carry a cost in dollars and days, the realities of weather cannot be ignored. Shuttle program officials must recognize that Edwards is a permanent, essential part of the program. The cost associated with regular scheduled landing and turnaround operations at Edwards is thus a necessary program cost. Decisions governing space shuttle operations must be consistent with the philosophy that unnecessary risks have to be eliminated. Such decisions cannot be made without a clear understanding of margins of safety in each part of the system. Unfortunately, margins of safety cannot be assured if performance characteristics are not thoroughly understood, nor can they be deduced from previous flights' success. The shuttle program cannot afford to operate outside its experience in the areas of tires, brakes, and weather with the capabilities of the system today. Pending a clear understanding of all landing and deceleration systems and a resolution of the problems encountered to date in shuttle landings, the most conservative course must be followed in order to minimize risk during this dynamic phase of flight. Shuttle Elements The Space Shuttle main engine teams at Marshall and Rocketdyne have developed engines that achieve their performance goals and have performed extremely well. Nevertheless, the main engines continue to be highly complex and critical components of the shuttle that involve an element of risk principally because important components of the engines degrade more rapidly with flight use than anticipated. Both NASA and Rocketdyne have taken steps to contain that risk. An important aspect of the main engine program has been the extensive, quote, hot fire ground tests. Unfortunately, the vitality of the test program has been reduced because of budgetary constraints. The ability of the engine to achieve its program design life is verified by two test engines. These 
fleet leader engines are test fired with sufficient frequency that they have twice as much operational experience as any flight engine. Fleet leader tests have demonstrated that most engine components have an equivalent 40 flight service life. As part of the engine test program, Mayer components are inspected periodically and replaced if wear or damage warrants. Fleet leader tests have established that the low pressure fuel turbo pump and the low pressure oxidizer pump have lives limited to the equivalent of 28 and 22 flights, respectively. The high pressure fuel turbo pump is limited to six flights before overhaul. The high pressure oxidizer pump is limited to less than six flights. An active program of flight engine inspection and component replacement has been effectively implemented by Rocketdyne based on the results of the Fleet Leader engine test program. The life limiting items on the high pressure pumps are the turbine blades, impellers, seals, and bearings. Rocketdyne has identified cracked turbine blades in the high pressure pumps as a primary concern. The contractor has been working to improve the pump's reliability by increasing bearing and turbine blade life and improving dynamic stability. While considerable progress has been made, the desired level of turbine blade life has not yet been achieved. A number of improvements achieved as a result of the Fleet Leader program are now ready for incorporation in the space shuttle main engines used in future flights, but have not been implemented due to fiscal constraints. Immediate implementation of these improvements would allow incorporation before the next shuttle flight. The number of engine test firings per month has decreased over the past two years, yet this test program has not yet demonstrated the limits of engine operation parameters or included tests over the full operating envelope to show full engine capability. In addition, tests have not yet been deliberately conducted to the point of failure to determine actual engine operating margins. The orbiter has also performed well. There is, however, one serious potential failure mode related to the disconnect valves between the orbiter and the external tank. The present design includes two 17-inch diameter valves, one controlling the oxygen flow and the other the hydrogen flow from the tank to the orbiter's three engines. Each of the disconnect valves has two flappers that close off the flow of the liquid hydrogen and oxygen when the external tank separates from the orbiter. An inadvertent closure by any of the four flappers during normal engine operation would cause a catastrophe due to rupture of the supply line and or tank. New designs are under study, incorporating modifications to prevent inadvertent valve closures. Redesigned valves could be qualified, certified, and available for use on the shuttle's next flight. While the external tank is performed flawlessly during all shuttle flights, one area of concern pertains to the indicators for the two valves which vent the liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. These valves can indicate they are closed when they might be partially open. This condition is potentially hazardous since leaks of either gaseous oxygen or hydrogen prior to launch or in flight could lead to fires. This could in turn lead to a catastrophic failure of the external tank. NASA is currently studying design modifications to the valve position indicators. This effort could be expedited and the redesigned indicators installed before the next flight of the shuttle. Processing and Assembly During the processing and assembly of the elements of Flight 51L, various problems were seen in the Commission's review which could bear on the safety of future flights. Structural Inspections during the 51L processing, waivers were granted on 60 of 146 required orbital structural inspections. Several of these waivers were second-time waivers of inspections. A formal structural inspection plan for the shuttle fleet had not been fully developed, and not all of the 146 inspections had been scheduled for the 51L processing. In order to minimize the flight delay until the implementation plan could be fully developed, the waivers were documented, requested, and granted by Level 2 at Johnson. The structural inspection requirements are relatively new and not completely mature. 
A working group was formed in December 1985 to expedite a structural inspection plan. A plan now exists for future structural inspections. The Commission believes that these inspections should not be waived. The fleet of orbiters has no counterpart anywhere in the world. There is no database relative to reusable spacecraft. The orbiter's operating environment is totally different from that of airliners, and the program must closely track the effects of the orbiter's age and use. Records. Throughout the Commission's review of the accident, a large number of errors were noted in the paperwork for the Space Shuttle Main Engine Main Propulsion System and for the orbiter. The review showed, however, that in the vast majority of cases, the problem lay in the documentation itself and not in the work that was actually accomplished. The review led the Commission to conclude that the operations and maintenance instructions are in need of an overall review and update, and the performance of operations and maintenance instructions needs to be improved. Missed requirements. At the time of launch, all items called for by the operational maintenance requirements and specifications document were to have been met, waived, or accepted. The 51L audit review has revealed additional areas where such requirements were not met and were not formally waived or accepted. 1. A formal post-flight inspection of the forward external tank attach plate was not documented. 2. A forward avionics bay closeout panel was not verified as installed during orbiter rollover stacking operations. The area was properly configured prior to flight with installation of a locker. 3. Flight 51L was launched with only one of two crew hatch micro switches showing the proper indication. This condition was documented by a problem report and was deferred. No waiver was obtained, however. 4. Post-flight hydraulic reservoir sampling was not performed prior to connection of ground hydraulic support equipment at Dryden Flight Research Facility, but was performed in the orbiter processing facility. 5. During auxiliary power unit hypergolic loading operations, the number 2 tank evacuation prior to loading was not maintained above 20 inches of mercury for 5 minutes as required. 19.8 inches maintained for two hours. This incident was documented as an acceptable condition by Kennedy, Johnson, and Launch Support Service, but no waiver was submitted. 6. Landing gear voids were not replenished and crew module meters were not verified during final vehicle closeouts. The additional requirement to replenish the landing gear voids during launch countdown was performed. Inspection by proxy. Another aspect of the processing activities that warrants particular attention is the shuttle processing contractor's policy of using, quote, designated verifiers, end quote, to supplement the quality assurance force. A designated verifier is a senior technician who is authorized to expect and approve his own and his fellow technicians' work in specific non-flight areas instead of NASA quality insurance personnel inspecting the work. The aviation industry follows this practice in performing verifications for the Federal Aviation Administration. The shuttle processing contractor has about 770 designated verifiers, nearly 15% of the workforce. The NASA Quality Assurance Inspection Program no longer covers 100% of the inspection areas. Due to reduced manpower, NASA personnel now inspect only areas that are considered more critical. Thus, the system of independent checks that NASA maintained through several programs is declining in effectiveness. The effect of this change requires careful evaluation by NASA. Accidental Damage Reporting While not specifically related to the Challenger accident, a serious problem was identified during interviews of technicians who work on the orbiter. It had been their understanding at one point that employees would not be disciplined for accidental damage done to the orbiter, provided the damage was fully reported when it occurred. It was their opinion that this forgiveness policy was no longer being followed by the shuttle processing contractor. They cited examples of employees being punished after acknowledging they had accidentally caused damage. 
The technician said that accidental damage is not consistently reported when it occurs because of lack of confidence in management's forgiveness policy and technicians' consequent fear of losing their jobs. This situation has obvious severe implications if left uncorrected. Launchpad 39B All launch damage and launch measurement data from Pad B ground systems anomalies were considered to be normal or minor with three exceptions. The loss of the springs and plungers on the booster hold-down posts, the failure of the gaseous hydrogen vent arm to latch, and the loss of bricks from the flame trench. These three items are treated in Appendix 1, the NASA Pre-Launch Activities Team Report, May 1986. None contributed to the accident. Loss of bricks from the flame trench was also experienced during the launch of STS-1, April 1981, and STS-2, November 1981, from Pad A, though at locations closer to the center line of the vehicle. Since the brick was blown out of the flame trench and away from the vehicle, there is no evidence to indicate that the loose brick might have endangered the 51L vehicle, but it may be possible for damage to occur if the condition remains uncorrected. The Pad B fire brick is to be replaced by refractory concrete, as was done on Pad A. Involvement of Development Contractors The Space Shuttle program, like its predecessors Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, Skylab, and Apollo Soyuz, is clearly a developmental program and must be treated as such by NASA. Indeed, the chief differences between the shuttle and previous developmental programs are that the shuttle is principally a transportation system and employs reusable hardware. Reusability implies a new set of functions such as logistics support, maintenance, refurbishment, lifetime concerns, and structural inspections that must be addressed by the program. In order to enhance post-flight turnaround schedule and efficiency, NASA is striving to implement processing procedures accepted by the transportation industry. While this effort is useful, there is not an exact industry analogy to the orbiter vehicle's flight operations because each successive shuttle mission expands system and performance requirements. Consequently, the shuttle configuration is evolving as design changes and improvements are incorporated. The demands of individual payloads can cause significant additional developmental changes. These developmental aspects make significant demands, which can be met only by the following strategies. One, maintain a significant engineering design and development capability among the shuttle contractors and an ongoing engineering capability within NASA. Two, maintain an active analytical capability so that the evolving capabilities of the shuttle can be matched to the demands of the shuttle. The shuttle's developmental status demands that both NASA and all its contractors maintain a high level of in-house experience and technical ability. All shuttle contractors and their corresponding NASA project organizations express concern about the organization of contractor services. When shuttle operations were begun, the prime development contractors had total responsibility for all shuttle activities. The concept of a single shuttle processing prime contractor was adopted as NASA policy in 1981 and implemented in 1983 when a team led by Lockheed Space Operations was selected. The Lockheed team includes Lockheed Missiles and Space Company, responsible for processing the orbiter, Grumman Aerospace Corporation, responsible for operation and maintenance of the launch processing system, Pan American World Airways, charged with introducing and maintaining airline methods and techniques in the processing system. Morton Thiokol, Inc., responsible for processing the solid rocket boosters and external tank. And Rocketdyne, responsible for processing the shuttle main engines. Lockheed's performance as shuttle processing contractor is judged on the basis of a NASA grading system using agreed criteria. In September 1984, the company was marked down for failure to form a coordinated contractor team. As a result of that grading, Lockheed earned for that period an award fee of about one quarter of one percent of cost. 
on a maximum fee scale at that time of 1% of cost. Lockheed reviewed the findings of NASA's grading and did not quarrel with its major thrust. The award fee presently is a composite of incentives to be earned on mission success and cost control. It can vary along a scale of 1 to 14% of cost. The shuttle processing contractor was earning, at the time of the Challenger accident, about 6% of cost, or nearly midpoint on the scale. Although the performance of the shuttle processing contractor's team has improved considerably, serious processing problems have occurred, especially with respect to the orbiter. An example is provided by the handling of the critical 17-inch disconnect valves during the 51L flight preparations. During external tank propellant loading in preparation for launch, the liquid hydrogen 17-inch disconnect valve was opened prior to reducing the pressure in the orbiter liquid hydrogen manifold through a procedural error by the console operator. The valve was opened with a 6 pounds per square inch differential. This was contrary to the critical requirement that the differential be no greater than 1 pound per square inch. This pressure held the valve closed for approximately 18 seconds before it finally slammed open abruptly. These valves are extremely critical and have very stringent tolerances to preclude inadvertent closure of the valve during main stage thrusting. Accidental closing off a disconnect valve would mean catastrophic loss of orbiter and crew. The slamming of this valve, which could have damaged it, was not reported by the operator and was not discovered until the post-accident data review. Although this incident did not contribute to the 51L incident, this type of error cannot be tolerated in future operations, and a policy of rigorous reporting of anomalies in processing must be strictly enforced. During the pre-launch processing and post-flight refurbishment of the orbiter, Rockwell, the development contractor, acts largely as an advisor to the shuttle processing contractor. Martin Marietta has a similar role regarding the pre-launch processing of the external tank. In contrast, NASA directed the shuttle processing contractor to subcontract with Rocketdyne and Thiokol for the processing and refurbishment of the main engines and the solid rocket motors, respectively. If Rockwell and Martin Marietta as the development contractor, had a similar direct involvement with their elements of the shuttle system, the likelihood of difficulties caused by improper processing would probably be decreased. Furthermore, all shuttle elements would benefit from the advantages of beginning-to-end responsibility vested in individual contractors, each responsible for the design, development, manufacturing, operation, and refurbishment of their respective shuttle elements. End of section 21. Recording by John Michael, Sussex, Wisconsin, USA, January 2021. Section 22 of Report to the President by the Presidential Commission on the Space Shuttle Challenger Accident. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Report to the President by the Presidential Commission on the Space Shuttle Challenger Accident. Recommendations. The Commission has conducted an extensive investigation of the Challenger accident to determine the probable cause and necessary corrective actions. Based on the findings and determinations of its investigation, the Commission has unanimously adopted recommendations to help assure the return to safe flight. The Commission urges that the Administrator of NASA submit, one year from now, a report to the President on the progress that NASA has made in effecting the Commission's recommendations set forth below. 1. Design the faulty solid rocket motor joint and seal must be changed. This could be a new design eliminating the joint or a redesign of the current joint and seal. No design options should be prematurely precluded because of schedule, cost, or reliance on existing hardware. All solid rocket motor joints should satisfy the following requirements. 
the joints should be fully understood tested and verified the integrity of the structure and of the seals of all joints should be not less than that of the case walls throughout the design envelope the integrity of the joints should be insensitive to dimensional tolerances transportation and handling assembly procedures inspection and test procedures environmental effects internal case operating pressure recovery and reuse effects flight and water impact loads the certification of the new design should include tests which duplicate the actual launch configuration as closely as possible tests over the full range of operating conditions including temperature full consideration should be given to conducting static firings of the exact flight configuration in a vertical altitude independent oversight the administrator of nasa should request the national research council to form an independent solid rocket motor design oversight committee to implement the commission's design recommendations and oversee the design effort this committee should review and evaluate certification requirements provide technical oversight of the design test program and certification report to the administrator of nasa on the adequacy of the design and make appropriate recommendations two shuttle management structure the shuttle program structure should be reviewed the project managers for the various elements of the shuttle program felt more accountable to their center management than to the shuttle program organization shuttle element funding work package definition and vital program information frequently bypass the national sts shuttle program manager a redefinition of the program manager's responsibility is essential this redefinition should give the program manager the requisite authority for all ongoing sts operations program funding and all shuttle program work at the centers should be placed clearly under the program manager's authority astronauts in management the commission observes that there appears to be a departure from the philosophy of the 1960s and 1970s relating to the use of astronauts in management positions these individuals brought to their positions flight experience and a keen appreciation of operations and flight safety nasa should encourage the transition of qualified astronauts into agency management positions the function of the flight crew operations director should be elevated in the nasa organization structure shuttle safety panel nasa should establish an sts safety advisory panel reporting to the sts program manager the charter of this panel should include shuttle operational issues launch commit criteria flight rules flight readiness and risk management the panel should include representation from the safety organization mission operations and the astronaut office three criticality review and hazard analysis nasa and the primary shuttle contractors should review all criticality one one r two and two r items and hazard analyses this review should identify those items that must be improved prior to flight to ensure mission safety an audit panel appointed by the national research council should verify the adequacy of the effort and report directly to the administrator of nasa four safety organization nasa should establish an office of safety reliability and quality assurance to be headed by an associate administrator reporting directly to the nasa administrator it would have direct authority for safety reliability and quality assurance throughout the agency the office should be assigned the workforce to ensure adequate oversight of its functions and should be independent of other nasa functional and program responsibilities the responsibilities of this office should include the safety reliability and quality assurance functions as they relate to all nasa activities and programs direction of reporting and documentation of problems problem resolution and trends associated with flight safety five two hundred 
Improved Communications The Commission found that Marshall Space Flight Center project managers, because of a tendency at Marshall to management isolation, failed to provide full and timely information bearing on the safety of Flight 51-L to other vital elements of shuttle program management. NASA should take energetic steps to eliminate this tendency at Marshall Space Flight Center, whether by changes of personnel, organization, indoctrination, or all three. A policy should be developed which governs the imposition and removal of shuttle launch constraints. Flight readiness reviews and mission management team meetings should be recorded. The flight crew commander or a designated representative should attend the flight readiness review, participate in acceptance of the vehicle for flight, and certify that the crew is properly prepared for flight. 6. Landing Safety NASA must take actions to improve landing safety. The tire, brake, and nose wheel steering systems must be improved. These systems do not have sufficient safety margin, particularly at abort landing sites. The specific conditions under which planned landings at Kennedy would be acceptable should be determined. Criteria must be established for tires, brakes, and nose wheel steering. Until the systems meet those criteria in high-fidelity testing that is verified at Edwards, landing at Kennedy should not be planned. Committing to a specific landing site requires that landing area weather be forecast more than an hour in advance. During unpredictable weather periods at Kennedy, program officials should plan on Edwards landings. Increased landings at Edwards may necessitate a dual ferry capability. 7. Launch Abort and Crew Escape The shuttle program management considered first stage abort options and crew escape options several times during the history of the program, but because of limited utility, technical infeasibility, or program cost and schedule, no systems were implemented. The Commission recommends that NASA make all efforts to provide a crew escape system for use during controlled gliding flight. Make every effort to increase the range of flight conditions under which an emergency runway landing can be successfully conducted in the event that two or three main engines fail early in ascent. 8. 201. Flight Rate The nation's reliance on the shuttle as its principal space launch capability created a relentless pressure on NASA to increase the flight rate. Such reliance on a single launch capability should be avoided in the future. NASA must establish a flight rate that is consistent with its resources. A firm payload assignment policy should be established. The policy should include rigorous controls on cargo manifest changes. The policy should include rigorous controls on cargo manifest changes to limit the pressures such changes exert on schedules and crew training. 9. Maintenance Safeguards Installation, test, and maintenance procedures must be especially rigorous for Space Shuttle items designated Criticality 1. NASA should establish a system of analyzing and reporting performance trends of such items. Maintenance procedures for such items should be specified in the critical items list, especially for those such as the liquid-fueled main engines which require unstinting maintenance and overhaul. With regard to the orbiters, NASA should develop and execute a comprehensive maintenance inspection plan, perform periodic structural inspections when scheduled and not permit them to be waived, restore and support the maintenance and spare parts programs, and stop the practice of removing parts from one orbiter to supply another. Concluding Thought The Commission urges that NASA continue to receive the support of the administration and the nation. The agency constitutes a national resource that plays a critical role in space exploration and development. It also provides a symbol of national pride and technological leadership. The Commission applauds NASA's spectacular achievements of the past and anticipates impressive achievements to come. The findings and recommendations presented in this report are intended to contribute to the future NASA successes 
that the nation both expects and requires as the 21st century approaches. End of section 22. End of report to the president by the Presidential Commission on the Space Shuttle Challenger Accident.